So, um, hello viewers, uh, thank you. First thing to, to say, uh, we want to thank you for being here again uh, in this uh, Interior Ecologies Conference organized by um, Head Maya and the Institute for Postnatural Studies. My name is Pablo Ferreira, I'm one of the members of uh, the Institute for Postnatural Studies, and we come with Javier Fernandez Contreras, head uh, of the, the Maya department. Um, Hello, everyone. University of Geneva. Um, thank you very much for joining us in this uh, last stretch of the conference. Today, we count with contributions, uh, with a variety of contributions, um, starting with uh, Studio Meteora that will be shortly with us. We will be doing a live uh, well, kind of uh, experimental interview um, directed by uh, my students. Um, for that matter, and um, actually with uh, by by the will of Meteora, we are inviting you, all of you uh, that are in YouTube that are connected, connecting from anywhere, to jump into our Zoom account and be active members, active speakers, uh, and take part in, in to this uh, chaotic uh, interview. We will also be sharing a link to the mirror board in which the interview is going to take place. So let me really quickly, and first of all, get the link for, for um, this call and share it on YouTube as a comment. Um, let me see, I don't see the comments now. Um, well, I am... Hmm. Let me really quickly look at the comments. Ah, there you go. Um, after Studio Meteora, we will come with Beatriz Colomina, who will be giving a lecture. She will join uh, later on after the key, well, after the whole interview with Meteora. And lastly, uh, the last contributor or the last uh, participant will be Liam Young. Liam Young uh, played his movie, or we played Liam Young's contribution last night, uh, but unfortunately he couldn't make it in time. Uh, he had some um, flying issues, um, but he was, uh, kind enough to join us today uh, for a round table, round of question and, and answer um, to discuss his work, which we are really, really thankful for. Um, I just copy the Zoom link into the comments on the live YouTube. So for uh, anyone who is watching, we will kindly invite you to jump into our, into our, into our Zoom, um, Zoom call. With um, no more to say, I will give the floor to um, Sofia, Sabaco, and, and Emma, the students who are going to direct the conversation. But first, Javier, if you want to say something else. No, I think that was a, a brilliant presentation. So looking forward for this experimental conversation format uh, with the Studio Meteora and with Maya students. And please be all welcome. Yes, thank you, Pablo, and thank you, Javier. And again, welcome to Studio Meteora. You're also welcome to turn on your cameras and we can kind of just start the conversation a little bit. Um, just for everyone in the audience, uh, we will introduce Studio Meteora as a collective, as a group. And then we might ask you if you want to introduce yourselves as individuals as well. So Studio Meteora is a design studio and architectural practice of the Chair for Digital Architectonics, Professor Dr. Lodger Hofstadt in ETH Zurich in the Department of Architecture. Um, the studio is conducted by Jorge Orozco, Adil Bocari, and Miro Roman, who are all three joining us today. Um, their practice delves into the complexities and difficulties of the contemporary world, exploiting the wealth of digital information that surrounds us. Through the use of artificial intelligence, they explore the abundance of digital information, be it news articles, film, literature, photographs, artworks, memories, and all else, to shape architectural positions aligned with current events. They perceive today's hyper-connected world as what they call a planetary garden that gives nature its fair share, while celebrating recycling to preserve the vitality of objects and ideas. 
We eagerly anticipate today's conversation, which will transform into an inclusive and open conversation, inviting everyone who is watching to participate both in the conversation and in this format of Miro and kind of just sharing of ideas um, and an exchange of yeah, thoughts and ideas. This thorough dialogue promises to unveil a nuanced understanding of their vision and the profound significance woven into their body of work. So we now welcome Adil, Jorge, and Miro. Thank you all three for being here. Um, and maybe we just invite you to say a couple words about yourselves as individuals, and most importantly, to do something that we as students have been practicing lately, which is to do a little check-in of how you're feeling today. Okay, maybe I can start. My name is Adil Bukhari. I'm feeling great. We we just had uh, our final reviews uh, yesterday and the day before, and it was fantastic. We're a bit exhausted. We might not have enough distance, but I think it's a good time to delve back into the studio. So I'm a, I'm a researcher at the chair of digital architectonics, as you mentioned, and I'm currently doing my PhD and on the side or doing the PhD on the side and teaching Studio Matura along with it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm interested in scenography. I'm interested in theatricality, perspective, and computer graphics. So uh, these, these kind of... Uh, uh, interest also then emerge out of the studio and the kind of visuals we do and the kind of uh, architectural uh, articulations that we do as well. Yeah, maybe you guys can go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Miro. I also feel amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a, a kind of architect by education, did my PhD here with, uh, with Ludger. Now I have an assistant professorship in uh, Innsbruck, where I run a design studio. And then I also run a, with the guys the design studio here. And then in principle, it's about, so the, the, the basic stories are if we have all this abundance of data, yeah, all the books, all the images, all the movies, all everything, does this change how we think about architecture or how we think about the world? And then to, to kind of play around, I mean, I'm heavily influenced. My work is heavily influenced by Meteora. Yeah? So it's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, it feeds from itself. So what we develop together, I kind of practice. And then what I practice, we kind of develop together. So it's kind of the, the same game with different iterations. And I like to develop different characters to, to kind of render this idea. Yeah? So the main character, the main research character is Alice, CH3 and 81. And then a kind of a rendering character into practice is Sol. So, and I think we can later discuss these things. Mm -hmm. Yes, and me, uh, hello everybody, I am Jorge. Uh, I'm also very happy, very happy for the results of yesterday, very happy with uh, uh, being here now. I am a trained architect as well. I work in academia as well. I'm a software developer as well. I finished the PhD here a few years ago uh, within the group. So the three of us, uh, we started Studio Meteora. Now it was, it's the ninth season. So we've been constantly rethinking what are we doing in terms of, of, of the studio, but this reflects as well in my, in my private, private and other academics endeavors. Uh, I am a guest professor uh, for design and computation at TU and uh, UDK Berlin. And uh, as well, I am um, I I develop software for architectural offices. I love working in academia, but I'm very curious as well as to how these these academic ideas and and these young young uh, heavily uh, heavily maintenance gardening of of education uh, influences. Uh, the, the the outside world, the other world, the other side of, of, of the coin. So I am a kind of a digital hoarder. I don't know. I, I like to collect stuff. Uh, I like to 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 index things, to to make little apparatus to be able to reach them out very fast. And by that, trying to articulate uh, by myself a position towards a project or toward, towards a brief. And uh, and I love sharing this with the students as well. The students are are probably we will talk about this uh, probably in detail. But this is the 
the the part that I enjoy sharing a lot. Uh, let's let's build a communal space of references of indexes of things that we care about. Let's share it. Let's animate it. Let's have them at our fingertips. And I think, uh, uh, as the guys mentioned, maybe this is going to change how we think of architectural design and, and architectural education, architectural practice. So yeah, this is this is me in, in one minute today. No, that's great. Thank you very much. And to everyone watching, we wanted to maybe start the conversation by sharing a video that you shared with us through the open call, because we think that it really showcases the kind of work that you do. And it's uh, just an exciting way to get the conversation started. So I will go ahead and share that. I wake up to a screen. I talk to people miles away. I say good morning, they say hi. In Studio Matura, we always make it a point to discuss global problems. Because the world is fast, bright, and colorful. Full of ideas and intelligence, all served for an electric feast. These games were fast, in that you work with the world, in that you don't care what things mean. I collect beautiful objects. They are intelligent. They are of many colors. Together with them, I can access an abundance of concepts, recycle them, play with them, use them to create my own architectural position. And is motivated by the global environment of the world. So we are creating this challenging stand. I am an architect in love with the internet. I am friends with AI. work and it's completely different from what, uh, what, what other architects do. So and that's a, I find very fascinating how you're doing it. Can something be completely clean or are we always constantly moving towards the states because something can always be cleaner? Will we ever stop cleaning? In times where individuals ask themselves, what can I do, what do I know, what am I, and obviously never find an answer, we need to be reminded that it's okay to not know, to be in cause. My whole life I've spent studying every musical masterpiece of the last 10 decades, trying to learn what exactly makes a song a classic. And it was in this moment that I finally got it. A classic is a song that has never finished saying what it has to say. We bonded over books, TV, music, movies. We expressed our shared opinions on John, uh, Jean Didion, J. Dilla, Dubstep, Escape from New York, Sports, and Mexican food. Yes, yes, no, yes, no, and yes. I sat on the balcony and watched the swimmers. They looked like Apollo, Mars, Jupiter, Adonis, Hercules, Narcissus. I saw the structure of bones the origins of muscles in so many different natural and noble positions and poses. Thirsty? Do you want pineapple, papaya, guava, peach, coconut, apple, orange, strawberry, grapefruit, pink grapefruit, cherry, apple, apple, strawberry or grape juice? Do you want verdant milk, vegetable liqueur or mushroom saliva? We only have iodine and kombucha here. All my projects start with the intelligence of everything. I develop my own search engines with AI to play with concepts and atmospheres for my architecture. Ask Alice is my search engine to write my own stories from thousands of books. I search for texts, concepts and expressions related to my interest. They become the building blocks for my story. I copy them, reframe them play with them. My voice talks through many other voices. Panoramas of Cinema is my search engine to curate images from thousands of movies. I search for architectural elements, places, objects 
and environments. They become the atmospheric mood board for my spaces. Search No More is my search engine to compose scenes from thousands of precious models. I render my stories and temperaments on stage. I draw with many other hands. I develop an architectural position, building on thousands of years old tradition of thought and imagination, and celebrate my hyper connection to the world. And now little sweetheart coming. All right, so now we will be jumping into the Miro board where we can conduct the interview and conversation. Um, again, all participants are welcome to, to join us in this. Um, let me just make sure that we are sharing the screen. All right, and just for some very brief logistical things. If you want to add any comments or questions or things that come up, you are welcome to do so um, in a bright color. We just said yellow, but really something that will st stand out. And you can also use either the shape or the pen tool to draw, to circle things, do as you wish with the board. Um, that will also make for a more interactive discussion. So maybe we can just begin by talking a little bit about your studio and the work that comes out of it. Uh, I think we were all very curious as to, you know, with this abundance of information that exists digitally, how do your projects or the themes for the seasons kind of originate? Like, what is the maybe the starting point of them since there's just so much to go off of yeah maybe we like since we start with the text then i kind of maybe start huh like the what what so i think what's two two important things which we want to stress huh one is rule number one we have only two rules rule number one is we don't start from a tabula rasa. We don't like tabula rasa. We want the full table. So we want the plenty. We want the whole internet. And then the question is, what do we do from there? Yeah, that's one thing. And then the second thing to stress out is no moralizing. Yeah? So we don't want to be good. We mm -hmm. think being good is on one side being aggressive and on the other side being patronizing to the others just to make a little bit of drama here, yeah? like don't take my words too seriously. I just want to kind of create a little bit of uh, problems. Yeah? And then I think where it gets interesting is what I think is a problem today is that architects, and not just architects, but I think people in general in, in creative uh, uh, fields, they start to take the good stories from around and then apply them to their projects and to their objects in order to be good, you know? So then you, for instance, today to be good, you want to be green, yeah? So you are green, you don't eat meat, you are vegetarian, you do yoga, you drink green tea, you are politically correct. Of course, you are a feminist, you are in love with the refugees. In all these wars, you are always on the correct side, you know, like there is this kind of correctness and goodness embedded. But then the, the price to pay for this is that things get boring and that you are basically mirroring existing stories. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you create an object and then you say, my object is good, 
because it's sustainable, because of this and because of that. And in principle, you don't have a face. So you are just a follower of what someone else thinks is the correct way to move. Therefore, when we start with our studio from the plenty, the first thing we do is we want to write a text. So mm -hmm. we want to talk about what we think is important. And how do we do it? We do it in a funny way. So we do it from the plenty. Here we have, for instance, Ask Alice, which is a search engine for a specific library. And this library is called Xenoteca. And it's a library that we give to all the students on ETH. They have access to it. There is more than 15, 000, uh, 1,500 books. And these books are not neutral. Yeah? And we don't, don't believe that any AI is neutral. So these books are biased and they're highly biased towards architecture, towards mathematics, towards philosophy, and towards computing and physics. And then students write their texts. So they have to find something that they're interested in. We usually frame it with a kind of a global problem to be in the current discussions. yeah. And then they write in someone else's terms, which means they use sentences and they use quotes from books, which are complicated books, philosophical books, I don't know, from Aristotle or from Gilles Deleuze or from whoever, but they don't use it in a way, you know, how usually people teach you philosophy and these complicated things that you have to know it. You know, you have to own it in order to talk like Aristotle. And for us, it's the other way around. You use Aristotle, you instrumentalize Aristotle for, so that he kind of supports your arguments. So that's the, that's the for instance, the third point. Huh? You are writing in someone else's terms, and by this you are in dialogue with the with the whole history, yeah? with everything that's being written, or with everything from this specific from this specific library. Mm. And this is one phase of an architectural project. By this, students get a stance, a stance. They get a position towards what's going on, and they are expressing their thoughts in terms of text. And then we have a radical shift. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, sorry. No, no, please, please, uh, Sophia, I talk too much, so please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you would say that because um, nowadays we we have so much more access to AI and machine learning in our everyday lives, and there's maybe sometimes the argument that because we're just kind of referencing and regurgitating what already exists, that we're going to kind of run out of originality but you'd say that it's kind of the opposite because we're kind of instead of just trying to follow one path and all do the same and we're all kind of trying to work towards the same goal of as you said the like good or green or um that is just kind of referencing everything even the things that are not always like seen as good in the in the media I think yeah, so something so something like this. I think uh, for for us, this means this is a very interesting question uh, on 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 what is the what is an original, what is the copy, what is recycling. Uh, we have a, a philosophical stance that uh, that everything everything emits, receives, shares, and processes information. So every, every all the things in the world are active and are talking to you, not in a natural language way as we are speaking, but they are there and they have been there in one way or another. So we we think that uh, that now, of course, the internet and, uh, and all these protocols are making this on steroids. This hyper connection is on steroids, but we think that it has always been like this, that we have always been connected, but the scale of this connection is what it's changing. So then, if 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 you if you if you follow up this line of thought, then you say, okay, maybe the question is that the questions have always been there. Mm -hmm. The critical questions, the most important questions, have always been there, and they always have different answers. Mm -hmm. So we are just need to learn to deal with this new scale of objects, multimedia, uh, histories, 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 stories, pop culture, philosophy, that is always talking to us. 
And, and to link it a little bit back to what Miro was saying, in the sense that, that uh, it's not then a question of start running around things, but being able to place this, this uh, hyper-connection, this uh, light speed information, to be able for you as an architect to be able to, to stand, you know, to, to, to not run after things. More like being able to, to look at them, to select them, to tag them, to mark them, and to say, okay, this plus this plus this plus this. I want to talk about something. I have an architectural question. It doesn't matter where where my answers will come from in terms of medium, in terms of times, in terms of culture, subculture, pop culture. But since it's there and I want to integrate it with my speech, then I can just play with it. So it is not about what was the original the, the orig originality in this in this scale it kind of it's going it's a secondary question mm -hmm. then i yeah, I, maybe I can uh, ah, okay yeah maybe i can riff off uh, what Jorge and miro said you know i mean whenever we start a project so we have these terms right uh, like inspirations we have these terms like precedents we have uh, these uh, we always have these kind of mood boards uh, this and that when we start architectural projects or writing projects and any kind of project right but then really uh, with us it's we we really want to embrace this so we want to embrace the 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 stories that repeat along the spirals of history. We want to embrace the 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 intelligences that are present around. And then it turns out the more you chase, the more you start uh, chasing things out, instead of going to origins of things, we want to we want to create large indexes of things, and then start to start to kind of uh, uh, develop a, a mood of a project rather than uh, uh, questioning if it's original or not, or if it's authentic or not, or if it's uh, uh, or if it's an homage or not as well. So it turns out uh, we're always speaking in many tongues. We're always kind of uh, seeing with many eyes. We're always drawing with many hands. And this 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 is how we kind of uh, play with history a little bit. And this also opens up this, uh, this space where we can, yeah, as Mira said, uh, <laughs> that we can talk with Aristotle. So it's not uh, it's not just big, uh, so if this were a, a, a moral project, this would be very dangerous, right? That we can deploy Aristotle to make a political point in our favor. So this th this is where the, the 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 moralisms have to die for us to be liberated and be able to talk to these uh, characters from long ago, from today, and from tomorrow, hopefully as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, Jorge, Adil, and Roman, I think that uh, maybe I can jump in with with a provocative question because I think that uh, you know, like in the history of architectural theory and practice, like uh, a big endeavor over the last twenty years has been the question of ethics, basically. So, as opposed to uh, to put it simple, how architecture was framed in official media, such as publications or biennials or discussions, like the twentieth century. A big chunk of architectural theory was really focused on the tectonics and architecture as a kind of container devoid of, of life, human and non-human, and really about aesthetics. And then over the last 20 years, we have seen a massive amount of biennials, books uh, talking about the politics of design, the everyday, the agency of human and the non-human, etc. cetera. Uh, but then when you, and obviously ethics have played a, a massive kind of role in, in that. So when you say we don't want to be good, I think it's, it's quite a, a, a kind of provocative uh, position and very compelling as of today because it's kind of contesting, uh, as you said in your presentation, like the flattening of the thinking that that this might uh, produce. And yet, I think that when we saw your video uh, in, in this kind of hyper-accelerated kind of montage with multiple screens, uh, there is a certain techno-optimism, we could argue, because there is a preference for whitish colors as opposed to, to black colors uh, of other digital practices. Uh, and I would be um, I would be curious to, to learn from you if this kind of multi-screen with a lot of kind of uh, screen and data and super accelerated tempo uh, can also produce a certain flattening of the thinking uh, similar to the one that kind of uh, trying to be good is kind of producing. And I would like to to learn how you Meteora Studio Meteora position when it comes actually to to some keywords and things that you have mentioned, like 
such as the refugee crisis, the climate crisis, or the question of feminism. So do you do you take a position or you just simply try not to uh, stand uh, in uh, in regards to these questions? I mean, here, I think what's what's really important, so we are not uh, um, running away from these things. huh? So we want to deal with global problems which are at the moment. W what we just think it's very important today huh, is to look at objects from different perspectives and talk to them. Huh? So not to say that we don't want to take a stance or that we don't, we, 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 we really think, for instance, that with databases, yeah, databases are always biased. We like biases, we like fetishes, we like having opinion. The problem is, and the only problem is, once you have an opinion, why do you think this opinion is so important that everyone should follow your opinion, you know? Once mm -hmm. you try, try to universalize your opinion as the truth, then we are in a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So let's not have a place where we have the truth. Rather, let's talk about how to look at things from different perspectives while having an opinion. And with the idea, the more I learn, I will change my opinion. And there mm -hmm. is no one morals, moral. There are many moralities. Yeah, There is no one way of thinking what is ethics. Every <laughs> continent has its own ethics. Every culture has its own ethics. Every person has its own morals. The only problem that we see is once you get the power and once you want to universalize a specific understanding of goodness or a specific understanding of morality or a kind of, you know, the ethics of the West and so on. Yeah, This is where we get very nervous. But we like feminism and the best feminism is xenofeminism. Yeah? It's a strange feminism. That's why... The library is called Xenoteca. Yeah? So th th they are cool things. We, we love them all. Yeah. Yeah. And on the other side, uh, also, I think it's important to mention in, in, uh, in, in terms of architecture as well, the history of architecture is ripe with, uh, with, 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 with projects that push particular political agendas, right? But we, we like to think of architecture as, as something that can host these discussions rather than take a side on its own. Mm -hmm. So we want, to, we want to create spaces that can host uh, all kinds of tribalisms, that can host all kinds of opinions, that can host all kinds of... Uh, spectralities that we see in the in the in the in the sphere of politics philosophy uh, and so on and that it that it needs to be generous enough for that because otherwise we get into yeah very troublesome terrain let's say yeah i think it's it's a uh, it's it's uh, for me interesting to make a distinction between what is morally good and what is eth eth ethically correct you know, because uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the system of values are different, and I think that that all these complicated complicated issues in the world are based on morals. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for us, it's important to say it's not about morals; it's about ethics. It's about saying what is the best decision that I can make that is not that the, the most adequate decision today for this problem. And then this means that you need to suspend the moral judgment to the last set. To, to, the moral judgment needs to go to a grain of salt. But the ethical compromises, then you need to face them. And then how to make an ethical compromise, how to make an, uh, an ethical decision, then you need to be able to, 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 to take an object or take an event and rotate it and turn it and put it next to the other one. So you get you get more uh, more robust and capacious and generous way to make certain decisions and this goes with 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 architecture when you are building when you are building so how can this object how can this building be a miniature of the world that is able to to receive as Adil is mentioning to receive these ethical discussions and morals is kind of outside in, in a sense so we are not running away we are just our value system we are pushing a value system that is uh, uh, different. Yeah, our ethics is that there should be no morality. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, I would like to...
to 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 jump in because I'm I'm loving this conversation. I started architecture not so long ago, and I was also a victim of this of the morality of architecture. Uh, I went to a school that was uh, rather good, but have I mean I we didn't get to the point of of losing restraints of losing this morality of the job of the architect and jumping into creating a critical own thought, which for me, it's, it's crucial what you guys are saying and sharing, um, which is basically, let's break away from all these restraints. Let's stop this buenismo, goodism, and let people confront their own realities. Then ethics will be, uh, I mean, it's, it's a common ground at the end, you know, it being ethically in a context, ethically co correct in a context is something you can you can uh, jump in through uh, or arrive through uh, different ways. But it's definitely morality that can really get you away from that objective. And I have a question uh, on your methodology, because I would have loved to to jump in a studio like this. How do you I mean, I'm pretty sure you find a lot of students uh, especially if they are coming from different contexts, different countries, there's going. You must be finding a lot of moralities. This, I mean, a lot of uh, own restraints, cultural, so social restraints from really, really diverse uh, backgrounds. My idea is, how do you break away from those, or how do you help, or what tools do you give students to be able to, you know, get loss of those restraints? And go after the, you know, the the purchase or the chase of own ethics. Yeah, I think this is a, yeah, this is a, a very interesting question, and it's the first. This is exactly the day one of our studio. This is exactly what you're mentioning. This is the the key, the thing that we spend most of the time with it because because we are not since we we say we want the table that a table that is full, so we are not saying what cannot be on the table. So these things are brought, you know, they, these these morality positions are brought here, but then for us it's it's super uh, 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 enriching and 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 beautiful that we come and then we discuss them. Oh. So every week for twelve weeks, like one one person, one project, one hour every week, and we're just talking about it. Right? So we are spending so much time. It's very it's very uh, uh, argumentative. You know, we 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 like to we were we were here educated with this. Uh, this is this is what we enjoyed the most. Uh, our 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 broader environment, the the environment where Meteora came from, it's based on this. So this is what we do. So we sit and we talk a lot, and then we argue, and then we just. It's not that we don't let these things to come in, but then we we just say is this is this uh is this appropriate so this idea that is is welcome should we push this if this if that if that when that you know and uh exactly this is that our students i think they are they are very puzzled by the freedom in a sense that we give them to bring absolutely whatever they want but then uh through a lot of a lot of uh uh, uh, uh dialogues and a lot of of time then we start the exercises to start bringing this to an architectural an architectural project but but you're right this is this is the first mm. the first big task that that we have and we kind of enjoy it of course yeah, and we aren't uh, we aren't empty vessels either huh? so <laughs> we also come from everywhere and then we have conflicts. We have conflicts. We have fetishes, and we have uh, particular interests. And this, for us, is uh, is is what keeps the conversation flowing. So then, uh, every student who comes to present their project, so uh, as Jorge mentioned, huh? so every week we sit down. Every student comes. You have as much time as possible. Uh, yeah, roughly an hour, <laughs> but uh, to to kind of bring all these conversations on the table, and then let's let's start playing. Then you know, let's start seeing. Okay, uh, we might uh, we might make a certain partition here. We might make a certain uh, 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 I don't know a certain room here. We might we might uh, create a certain space there, and so on and so forth. And then the conversation between us added with the with this influx of of energy and. And youth and joy that the, the students bring in, then it starts to to flow again. 
Yeah. And then just to, to add one more thing to, to this, and then, for instance, once we calibrate this kind of story yeah, through those discussions, then there is this shift and we retell the same story through another media. Yeah? So first is the text, then it's through the images and the movies, mm -hmm. and then it's through the models. And all of them are done through AIs that we kind of developed and that are very specific. And what we also think is in a way, just to connect back to, to, to the morals and so on, what we entice very much is to bring a sense of humor. Yeah? Humor, mm -hmm. and, and you said that there is a kind of an optimism, but we don't think of it as a techno optimism. But what we think really is, it's so easy to criticize. It's so easy to destroy. It's so easy to find flaws in projects of students. And it's so difficult when you have a big project to find beautiful things in it and to, to kind of give the energy and push the students in a, in a direction to explore these things. And I think our kind of, I will be now a very conservative and, and say our duty is to be positive, to be optimistic and to have a kind of a sense of, of humor. And what we should not do for sure is this what's happening around that you go, for instance, to art exhibitions and so on, and you go to all the art exhibitions and you agree with everything and everything is so nice and everything is so boring and it's so correct and nice and great. And, and then you go home reaffirming what you already know. You are not challenged in any way. You don't think about anything. Yeah? It's kind of, yes, I agree. And yes, I agree. It's so great. Wow, it's so fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, dirty kind of righteousness starts yeah. to uh, take its uh, root. Huh? And this is, yeah, this we are afraid of. Right? This is, yeah, this is kind of for us a red alert. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but then maybe I, I, I have a uh, kind of parallel question. Uh, of course, uh, please, uh, for other guests to the conversation, jump into it. I see that Simon Hu's line. Uh, the students, Beatriz Colomina are also connected. But then uh, very briefly, I would like to uh, be a bit provocative again. Like if we accept like in the history of thinking kind of relativism uh, uh, defends and advocates for the fact that all points of view are valid and sometimes equal. So that it also produces a flattening where we don't have like points of anchoring uh, or kind of lines of, uh, of development. Aren't you producing through this discourse a digital relativism? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the I will just go fast, yeah. Like the the problem of 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 these things, yeah, is but this is the the I think the political correctness produces this uh, 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 flatness, yeah. Of course, the the amount of information and so on. This also produces a certain flatness. But what we want. So we don't have a, a problem with hierarchies. Again, we think hierarchies in principle are nice. We want hierarchies, but like the internet, these hierarchies have to be fluid. So the whole point is to have a reference, but it's not an eternal stable reference, which is good. It's a, you know, it's like with Google search, if there is Corona, then the Corona becomes in, in the hierarchy of search top when people are searching. When there is another term, the hierarchy changes. So in, in this sense, of course, the flatland the flatland is the, the problem and the challenge of all of this information of ChatGPT, of DALI, of MidJourney, and so on. That's why we think it's important not to have one ChatGPT, but to have many ChatGPTs. Mm. One is biased to China, one mm. is biased to Russia, one is biased to Europe, one is biased to me, one is biased to you, one is mm. biased to the trees, one is biased to the rivers. And we are actually kind of in a funny way. So doing this by producing custom search engines mm. which we think go very well together with the ones of ChatGPT, Midjourney and so on because what ChatGPT, Midjourney and these guys are they are a common sense of the western world yeah, but it's very important that it's the western world so we can put ChatGPT on trial and we can see what are the Western world's taboos, but it doesn't apply for the Chinese. Yeah. Um, just to, uh, we had a, a conference, a contribution yesterday with Maria Esteban. Um, she's a colleague, and we together develop um, custom-made and absolutely biased uh, algorithms to which we fed a really close selection of texts, depending on, on what we wanted to obtain from them. And all of a sudden, the, the concept of useful is uh, rather changed. 
we also did a live test of uh, trying to, well, we asked the same question to different algorithms, uh, chat GPT, our algorith algorithm with a series of, series of texts, and then another version with another selection of text. And we ask um, the students live to tell which is the most useful question answer or which answer they thought it was more interesting or more in depth. And surprisingly, and this is something that we have been looking uh, while developing these bots, is that the, the very useful uh, you know, range of uh, artificial intelligence is to understand that it's absolutely biased, to understand that it's a, a, an extension of our intelligence. And that it's, it should be, I mean, we should start engaging into a, a new kind of relation to these uh, intelligences, knowing that what we're going to get is what we wanted from the first time. And there's no way to look around. There's no, oh no, I thought this was going to be a good answer. No, I mean, all these uh, engines, at the end, they are a reflection of, as you said, of, for example, ChatGPT, the Western world. Of course, we were really aware that we were only fitting English written books and scientific essays. So there was never a subjective approach as I believe, or I think it was all like a goodism statement of this should be blah, blah, blah. And I think it's, it's uh, we are at the, like at the, with, with examples like you, which I really think, think, uh, thank you. We are at the, you know, at the entrance of really understanding what's our relation to artificial, to other intelligences. For me, it's not so much artificial because it's human. It's purely human. It's our intelligence. It's an extension of us. It's making us cyborgs. It's making us a seno human, actually. And I love the reference to seno feminism. Um, so yeah, I, I, the topics of, of bias, bias intelligence and bias outcomes, it's something that should be in the table always. It will make us slightly free into, into purchase, like chasing our, our own objectives uh, in a really, really free and, and friction uh, way, I believe. Um, I don't know. Yes, uh, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to share to share that. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I if I quickly react to this, I think uh, of of course, yes, this is this is this is this is great, uh, and this is how we see it as well. And we don't we don't see it at level of usefulness. Mm. We see it at the level of of what what do you as an architect on a brief want to say? What's the story that you want to tell? And then. Mm ask to whoever kind of intelligence that you need, but it's not about the intelligence that you're asking to. Our intelligence from the East, from the West, an intelligence of images generating, of tech generating. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's any intelligence that can help you to deliver your architectural position. So this is this is uh, uh, important. What is very funny with, with, with the studio is that uh, we have different different uh, collections of, of movies, collection of of images, collections of text, collection of 3D models, of, of materials that we care about, that we as, as, as three researchers care about, plus what the students say, we need this, we need this. So this is kind of, of our Meteora kind of fertile, fertile ground. And this is the basis for these things. And what is interesting is that every semester we have 20 projects. And even though they are looking in principle heavily to the same garden that we are cultivating the projects are different the stories are different so it's not about it's not about alice it's not about panoramas of cinema it's not about uh, zero more it's not about mark it's about each project each student finding their own their own position so i think this is this is what we are what we are aiming at and it's exactly resonates with with uh, with what you are saying yeah of course it's not about the intelligences it's about what is your position? You have a question. What is your answer? What is your possible answer to this? <laughs> Completely. Um, yeah, maybe I can I can <laughs> I can carry on the the, yeah. <laughs> the kind of uh, theme. And then this uh, so going back to Chat GPT again, huh? And this kind of uh, uh, the 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 common sense, uh, a consolidated common sense of the planet. But just to just to kind of say as well that this is also incredibly valuable, right? So it's an incredible resource. I mean, already by now, 
I, as a, as a, you know, researcher, right, or whatever, I cannot work without it anymore. <laughs> you know, so I really, I really uh, try to test these things out with ChatGPT. It can summarize things. It can do a lot uh, of, of things uh, very, very quickly. That would be very tough to do otherwise. But then, what it does do is that it uh, it breaks connections. So it breaks indexes. And this is where the search engines that we we deploy and we develop uh, come into come into play. So we 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 get to objects that have a particular authorship. We get to objects that have a particular sensibility. They have a particular color, and then this color starts playing in the spectrality of the text that you develop. So it's not about severing connections, but trying to maintain them at the same time. And then uh, on the other side, then we get to formats. Huh? So with the, with these kind of intelligences that we have, they have flattened formats. So it's uh, you 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 give a text to ChatGPT, you say, okay, write uh, write a grant proposal from that instant. <laughs> so then these these become incredibly cheap, and it becomes even more important to start uh, uh, establishing, as you said, a personal connection to them a personal way of talking to them, uh, you know, like playing an instrument, like uh, everybody has a different relationship with the piano, right? A child can play it and a maestro can play it. They will play it differently, but it is accessible. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Just to add one more thing with, uh, with, with the chat GPT, huh? Like so, the the what what's at stake is that it's a common sense of the West, yeah. And it's a, in principle, if if we want to claim that it's neutral, then it's an imperialist gesture of of the West. So it should not be alone. It needs brothers and sisters. So there needs to be a whole of them, a lot. What's sexy about it? What's interesting about it is that Chat GPT is. It's a common sense as an object. So this is what computing gives you. It gives you the way to make an object out of common sense that you can ask questions. That's as a statement in itself is beautiful. What mm -hmm. this common sense does fantastically, for instance, if you have an API and then connect ChatGPT to an API, what you can do, and this we tried to play with this Adil in, in some of his works and then together all of us in um, in one exhibition we did, What's so beautiful about it that Chat GPT, because it's a common sense, it has an ability to glue things together. So Chat GPT is a universal glue. So you can say, okay, if I like David Bowie, and if I like uh, uh, the man on, on the moon or Mars or, or whatever, if I like a particular song from David Bowie, what's the color of that song? It's a blue color. If it's a blue color and it's this song, who's gonna be an architect to design that house. And this is something that Jorge did like 10 years ago in his experiments to, you know, and then if this is an architect, what does this architect want to eat for breakfast? And if he eats this for breakfast, like where does he want to go tonight to, to a club? And, you know, and you can glue things. So you can jump from one domain, from the domain of pictures to the domain of text and from the domain of text to the domain of jewelry, from the domain of jewelry towards the perfumes, and so on. And this is so beautiful and powerful. It brings a level of the problem with, with old school computation, not with AI, but like old school computation, it, it's rough. It's it's precise. You know, mm. if one letter doesn't work, the system breaks. Here we enter with a certain softness. And this softness is beautiful to glue, to glue this stuff. This is something which is very, very powerful. And then you have on one side, you have the common sense. On the other side, you have custom-made AIs, the small ones. And then on the third place, you have yourself as a person with something that you want to explore. And this triangle is something that we find extremely fruitful in the studio. Huh? Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that... Um... Uh, uh, Javier was uh, speaking, but uh, he was muted. Oh, you're muted again, Javier. No, no, please. Uh, I think Sophia wanted to ask one question, so please. Uh... Oh, sure. I was just going to say that I think that shows in in the work because all the images and videos and every kind of file that, that is produced really tells a different story. And like in a way, you're using architecture more as a stage for storytelling and as a platform for storytelling. And I really like what you said of like, 
there's no hierarchy of like what is most important and maybe some of the links are a bit more uh, expanded than we we would normally do like for example I don't know we really found your project uh, in Versailles very interesting because you're bringing in things that have nothing to do with Versailles like uh, weightlifting competitions and things that might seem absurd but at the end when brought all together they tell stories that are very compelling and kind of um, I don't know if unique or at least provoking uh, some kind of thought in some way and bringing all these links from references from literature and even like common media and music uh, so maybe not like exactly a question but just uh, an observation of that we really appreciated how you use architecture as a tool for narrative and for storytelling and I don't know if that's something that you do um, very intentionally through your work or is just the nature of you know using all of these parts of, of human uh, thought and these digital archives that you know it's very human to tell stories so maybe that's just naturally what happens when you put them all together no absolutely i think this is this is an excellent point and i think this connects directly uh, to what was said earlier as well the, the 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 kind of relationships we can form with machines huh? so we kind of figured out and this uh, Jorge did these experiments earlier as well and miro of course as well and then we kind of figured out that uh, chat gpt is very good at role play you know so if you okay. ask it to pretend like somebody or you know, pretend to be Ladoo, and then uh, can you can you draft a proposal for 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 a for a space in Versailles? So then suddenly it it starts to play a different game. So this is this is actually taking this commonsensical uh, kind of output and uh, the body of knowledge that ChatGPT carries, and start starting to diffract it a little, starting to make it a bit more specific, starting to characterize it. So it stops being an, an an automation of a large project, and it becomes uh, you know a dance with uh, automata, which are characteristic, which have a sensibility, which have a posture, which talk a certain way, and they don't give you answers directly. So they become whimsical characters that you have to talk to, you know, as uh, yeah, as he, as anything else, like plants, like plants, like animals, like you you try to establish communications on the basis that you will never fully understand them. So th this is very important for us, you know, even amongst our own relationships, we know we cannot fully understand the other person, but what we can try to do is establish channels of communication, you know, put things on the table, discuss them, and we might come to a certain kind of a contract, you know, a social contract, a, a natural contract, uh, a, a techno uh, a contract as well. And so all of these things come into play. Yeah, thanks a lot for this question. And then these are these are a very good point, uh, 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 Sophia, with the with the stories. Then what is the relation of the stories with with architecture or with buildings? And I think here for us the concept of of a masterpiece it's super important. Because then what is a masterpiece is not if not that that vivid object that is able to receive thousands and thousands of stories. I mean, if we look at, at iconic master buildings or paintings, so they are so so everybody can write about them. And the and these buildings are so masterful because they can be turned and then can be they can you can make they can receive links, they can receive stories. I mean, archi and architects who are theorists, for example, can look at the same building and, and tell another different story. And if it's a good story, then the building will receive it and we will kind of agree on it and say, yeah, this is this is it. So this is, a, 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 for me, a super for us, very su super important, uh, the relationship of what is stories with architecture that extends to other objects. But of the, the question of then masterpieces are able to do this, to open the arms and say, you want to tell this story about me? Welcome. And it resonates. If it's a master master uh, uh, piece, then it will it will resonate. Just to, to push this, uh, I mean, I love the, this part. So I would even stress it further. I would say that stories make architecture. So it's not that 
you know, it's intrinsic to it. Like every interesting object in our culture is interesting because we have put a lot of stories. And if the object itself has the capacity to, now I'm just repeating what Jorge said, yeah? It ha if it has a capacity to receive even more stories, then this is a masterpiece, yeah? Like for instance, for me, that the, in, in terms of architecture, what is very, very cool is this Pantheon in Rome. This mm. building is so cool that it even changed the gods. Huh? So even, you know, what it, it had a one set of gods which were hosted in the beginning, the Roman gods and all the gods. And then at one moment, they kicked them out and Jesus came in. Huh? So it's not only that it hosted different people, it hosted different gods. And what are gods than, than stories? Yeah. So I think a good object is composed out of many stories. One story is its form. Another story is its materiality. A third story are its details. The fourth story is a story written. The fifth story is how you look at it. The sixth story is the branding of it and blah, 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 blah. Mm. So we think that architecture is bringing things together. The text, the images, the models, and whatever you can think. Yeah, yeah and maybe just to be a bit uh, provocative with this, uh, this is also our take on sustainability. Huh? So beautiful things, beautiful stories, yeah. they are sustainable. I think the Pantheon is the most carbon neutral building on the planet. <laughs> it has like negative 1000 or something. <laughs> it's carbon footprint is like that. So these these things that, uh, that stay over time, collect stories over time and so on, they start... Uh, uh, th this becomes preserved and, and uh, reformulated on new scales and with new technologies, with new societies, with new philosophies, with new politics and so on. They, they stay and keep collecting new stories. Incredible. Okay. That was a, it's a really interesting approach also to look at the political meaning of objects, material buildings and how the meaning or I uh, guess, well, the stories, um, merge within, um, they make the object, they make the building, they make the project itself. Um, Meteora, I'm, I'm really, really sorry to say that we have just run over the time. Uh, the conversation has been amazing, has been really, really, really great, but I'm, uh, we have Beatriz Colomina that is uh, connecting uh, from the US and uh, we are running a little late, so I need to to somehow uh, well conclude the conversation here with you. Um, I would like to well, firstly, to thank you for for joining us, for trusting us, for sending your contribution, and for sharing and spending some time with us. Uh, I mean, you are in my you were in my radar from the open call, but you will definitely be from now on because I think the topics that um, you brought to the table are absolutely crucial when starting to to look at the future of relation with um technologies especially technology uh, this kind of technology that really requires us to have a philosophical and a critical knowledge a critical way of uh, relating to it because it's not so passive it's a really active technology that we are living with so thank you thank you so much uh, i don't know if javier or sofia want to add uh, something else as a goodbye no thanks a lot it's been a real pleasure to to have this conversation with with you and uh, if you pass by geneva we are we are neighbors so please uh, come to head and say hi yeah, yeah thanks a lot for the conversation yeah sorry sofia <laughs> no no just wanted to say thank you <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot. And hello, uh, Beatrice, as well. Uh, you taught me at the Stadel Schule in, in Frankfurt. <laughs> I was one of the students. But yeah, thanks a lot for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, Javier, Sofia. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ciao. Bye-bye. Um, oh, you are muted. I'm muted. Hi, how are you? Hello, so we'll go Hello, how are you? Sorry to miss the previous conversation. I only got the, the last uh, part. <laughs> so uh, we are going to, to change uh, register, right? And I was very curious about this conversation about uh, AI and ChatGTP and all of this. But um, hmm. of course, this is going to be a different, 
take on the question of interior uh, <laughs> ecologies. Are we already online? Yeah. Yes, we yes. are. All right. Really so, um, right. Do you want to check really quickly if the comments are working fine? Uh, we can... uh, no, I wanted to share the screen and make sure that I have for myself the the yes. presenter view because that's you know we haven't been using Zoom since COVID, so <laughs> <laughs> I am you. so sorry not to be there with you because it's so much nicer, right? Uh, Go ahead, uh, let's try um, and we'll see. Yeah. Okay. What do you see? You see the whole thing or you see the next slide? I no, always we, okay. we see the yes. whole screen. We the whole screen. Right. Yeah, one slide. Okay. Okay, then it's perfect. All right. So we can start. All right. Or you want to do an introduction or something? Um uh, Sophia uh, has prepared an introduction and that's you... so nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I actually have my colleague Emma here who will be doing the introduction, but welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Wanted to have like a little introduction of you and your work. So also for the audience. So Beatrice Konomina is a renowned architecture historian and tourist, creator, professor, and director of the program in media and modernity in the School of Architecture at Princeton University. Her works reflect on and question themes of architecture, art, technology, sexuality, and media, especially exploring links between architecture and modern institutions of representation, like printed media, photography, advertising, film, TV, and social media. Through her published work and international lectures and exhibitions, she has influenced the history she herself analyzes by constantly bringing to light issues that permeate our culture and society, and by examining architecture's role in them. As her contribution to our interior ecology symposium titled Towards a Transpecies Architecture, Beatrice will discuss the absurdity of the current state of human-centered design, because isn't a human just a container for bacteria? Why have we overlooked the organism that make our own life possible and how we can rekindle the relationship we once had with them in the soil and plants and other animals, perhaps through our probiotic architecture? So now uh, give it to you, Beatrice, the floor to present and thank you to be here with us today. Well, thank you very much for your generous uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be here, to be part of this interior ecologies uh, uh, conference. As I say, I'm very sorry not to be in person with you because so many exchanges happen in person, including exchanges of bacteria, which is always very good. So we are going to change the register from artificial intelligence to really uh, uh, microorganism or intelligence, bacterial uh, intelligence. Because if you want to really, I mean, the real question is, is it possible for humans and not humans to coexist, right? I mean, this is a, a very important question in our times, in these times in which we have managed to destroy so much of the of the planet, but also so much of the life in the planet. And if you want to talk about life, it turns out that the first form of life on Earth is bacteria, and bacteria is 4 billion years old, so we are really nothing. And bacteria, of course, makes plants possible, which makes trees possible, which makes buildings and architecture possible. Bacteria in architecture is always treated like the like the unwanted, right? Like some invisible enemy that needs to be destroyed, uh, exterminated by by all means. And we we want to talk about today about what happens if we put bacteria at the center of uh, of design, tuning, if you want, into the unwanted, into 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 what is always discarded. It was always uh, tried to eliminate. And, and try to learn from it, to live uh, with it. And of course, this means the center in the, the human. And that, of course, uh, is, uh, is a major issue in architecture because the history of architecture from the Renaissance, they say, to Le Corbusier, but you could go even further back and further forward, is always centered in this uh, very athletic, very wide, very young, in fact, uh, a man. Uh, which excludes most of the of humanity, of course, for once half of the population is gone, but also all the different uh, uh, races and ethnicities. But also, if you think about it, how if you happen to be white and you happen to be male, and you happen to be very athletic and very able about how long does this last, right? So it is it's very incredible to me that this fiction 
has organized architecture for all these centuries, right? This fiction that we keep holding on to and that represents not only uh, only a very small uh, part of humanity, but also in between this small, very small time frame for those very uh, individuals. Uh, so, uh, as I said, the, then the, the human in human center uh, design is typically in architecture, white, male, athletic, uh, and Western. But if you center architecture on bacteria, actually you will take better care of the human. This is what I'm trying to put forward. But it will not be this privileged uh, figure that sees itself superior um, uh, to all other species and most other humans. So, and even if you happen to be obsessed with the human, it's very important to understand that, um, that the human is this very a complex collaboration, this ever-changing uh, trans-species collaboration, right? The human is just a bag of bacteria, really, uh, which is around 40 trillion bacteria uh, is in our body, more, mostly in the digestive uh, tract. And many of these bacteria, as I say, have been around for millions of uh, the ones in our tract. I mean, bacteria in general has been around for billions of years. But the one in our tract has been around for millions of years. And the human is actually a very recent uh, arrival. And as it turns out, we may be already on our way out. So we may want to hear from these uh, fellow um, uh, uh, life forms that have been managed to survive on Earth for so long, right? And, you know, it's not just a, a bug, but really a tube, if you think. The human is kind of wrapped around this, uh, this uh, eight meters or so of the intestine. And the gut, as I say, is filled already with uh, so much bacteria. 4,000 species of bacteria are in our gut. In fact, there are more bacteria in the gut than they are human cells. And this is very important because the human cells the human cells that we have depend on that bacteria. This is the so-called microbiome that we talk a lot about in, in, in everywhere, in medicine first, but then in, in the popular press, in the newspapers, you hear a lot about the microbiome. The microbiome is this complex internal uh, community that sustains the body, the immune system, the health, the brains, and even the emotions. A lot of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, of our uh, recent research demonstrate that many forms of uh, depression is an imbalance in the gut. So if you are depressed, try to take some probiotics because it turns out to be that may be more useful than taking all these other things, all these medications that create even more havoc in your, in your body. So, so we are nothing at all without this, uh, this, this foreigners, this bacteria. We live in them more than they live in us, right? And these are a few images of bacteria. But modern architecture, which in many ways is the default architecture of the so-called developed uh, world, is really phobic about bacteria, pretty much from the moment that bacteria was, um, was discovered. This is, of course, uh, an image that you know very well of Villa Savoie, the entrance of Villa Savoie with the ramp and this, um, and this sink at the entrance, which many people, including myself, has uh, read in terms of the, in my earlier work on privacy and publicity, in terms of this obsession of Le Corbusier with these modern um, sanitary fittings and how he understood them as having these cultural qualities and how in an article in the Spring Nouveau, he talks about how a bidet will be in a museum in the 20th century because it represents us and everything. But now after COVID, I look at this picture and I say to myself, okay, these people just went through an incredible trauma, which is the 1918 uh, flu, of course, in which millions of people uh, all over the world uh, die, right? And of, we, ha we have so little memory of it. Right? And, and then I think, I look at this thing and I think, no, this, this thing is there because he wants people to wash their hands as they come into, into the house and he wants to make the sink right there in the middle of the space so there is not a question about going into a separate room to, to wash your hands. He wants you to wash your hands as you come into the room and I, there may be very good uh, reasons uh, for this. But going even back forward to the discovery of bacteria, Robert Koch, of course, was the first that demonstrated the link between a specific, a specific bacteria and disease. Diseases such as anthrax or tuberculosis or cholera. 
And this was happening in the 1870s and early 80s. You know that before there was this miasma theory of the disease, that all the diseases were transmitted by the air, that the smell was producing uh, disease. But at the same time that he discovered this, uh, this, uh, this bacteria and makes these beautiful drawings of anthrax uh, and these first photographs of, of anthrax and other uh, uh, bacteria, he launched a kind of media uh, campaign against this invisible um, enemy. Uh, Koch already exhibited the first, uh, these are anthrax spores, and anyway, this he first uh, exhibited the first photographs of these pathogens that I just showed you in a huge uh, hygiene uh, exhibition in, in Berlin in 1882. And you have here the catalog on, on the left of the Berlin hygiene exhibition of 82. And the following year in the exhibition in London, the International Health Exhibition in London, uh, it's very interesting to understand that in this period, there were these immense uh, uh, health exhibitions in which, as you will see, architecture plays a uh, very important part, and that they were incredibly popular. Hundreds of thousands of people will go through this exhibition. So the question of health was, of course, of major interest to, to the public everywhere. Why? Because people were dying uh, like flies from all kinds of bacterial uh, diseases. So in the exhibition in London, precisely, uh, he, the public uh, could look into this microscope and, and, and see this living bacteria from Koch laboratory. So Koch brought his, his bacteria to London and put it there so that people could look through the microscope and see uh, the bacteria um, that was there, but also imagine that bacteria that was already growing inside them. Because, of course, at that time, and this is actually... Uh, uh, drawings that are based on on Koch uh, microscopic uh, microscope photographs. They are, as you can see, of uh, tuberculosis, right? And tuberculosis at that time was killing so many people uh, worldwide. One in four people in the world uh, was dying from tuberculosis, and in big cities like Paris or London, it was more like one in three. So imagine, COVID was nothing compared uh, to this trauma. So they could look into this microscope and actually see the bacteria that was most likely uh, growing up uh, in, their, in, their, in their bodies. That was already there. Because in fact, even if you don't um, develop the infection, it doesn't mean that your, the bacteria is not there. It means that you have a good immune system, that you have good bacteria that, has, that is fighting the, the bug, uh, bacteria. But what is interesting too about the exhibition, and these are pages from the catalog, is that you, got, you start to see the role that architecture uh, plays. So there was a kind of new protocols uh, that were uh, exhibited in the exhibition for the design, not only of the city, but also the interior, and includes a new sanitary equipment like the water closet. But also you can see in the illustrations on the left, this kind of new and, and more hygienic, it may not look to you very modern, but it is very modern in the con context of 1882, very clean uh, interiors that are uh, considered more hygienic. In fact, one of the books that was published was exactly this, Our Homes and How to Make Them Healthy, that was published in the context of this uh, major uh, exhibition. Houses even uh, started to look uh, so architecture, in a way, you can say, becomes the first line of defense against this invisible uh, enemy that you have to see through the microscope. So how do you make that, that threat visible? It's architecture that allows you uh, to make it visible because it offers you an image of what an, a, an environment without bacteria looks like. So houses start to look like even like sanitized laboratories. This, for example, on the le is, the, is the house of Leopold uh, Bauer, uh, who completely organized his RESIC uh, villa of 901 uh, on the hygiene principle. And, and here is the illustration of this. This is, must be very, very shocking in 901 to see a kitchen uh, that looks like a laboratory, right? But this is the same year that his teacher, Otto Wagner, also was complaining in, in his writings about the culture of bacteria and call for architects to develop a new art form architecture, but which will be based on the latest hygiene uh, techniques. 
Uh, he argues, for example, that the design of a hotel room or the design of a, of a, of a bedroom should not be very different, very different from the design of a hospital uh, uh, room. He's completely obsessed with bacteria, and in particular, he advocates for the use of this uh, vacuum cleaner, which is a new uh, invention to remove dust. And this obsession with the dust is also very interesting because it was believed, and to a certain extent is correct, that dust... Um, was the problem that does contain the virus of tuberculosis, for example. And that's correct. I mean, if you have tuberculosis and you speed and that the spoton is now dry, 15 days later, it's still contagious. But uh, if you expose this very bacterium to the sun, and of course, if you vacuum it, uh, it, it with the sun, it becomes uh, inactive in a few seconds. Uh, and so these ideas that they have, which were not scientific yet, but they were onto something, right? They knew uh, somehow. It's kind of uh, paradoxical and kind of sad to hear that Wagner died actually of a bacterial infection, despite all these preoccupations with the sanitation in the home, in his own house, uh, before antibiotics were uh, developed. It's possible that with all this money of cleaning, he had managed to eliminate also the good bacteria, which, as I said before, kind of uh, helps with the bad bacteria. It was not until 1928, in fact, that the first antibiotic was accidentally uh, discovered, penicillin, and this is uh, Fleming, of course, Dr. Alexander Fleming, which in, was not very organized, apparently, was in his, uh, in his uh, lab. And he went on a holiday in 1928, and he came back and, and, and saw that mold uh, was growing on a petri dish that had uh, bacteria. And he noticed that the mold was preventing the bacteria around it from, from growing. So he realized, oh, is this mold can uh, be used against uh, uh, the bacteria. So even if it's not until 28 that we have penicillin, which is this mold, basically, which is accidentally discovered, as I, as I say, to talk about the fact that they already kind of knew, because already in 9-11, in women's magazines, you see that they were advising women to leave petri dishes in their, uh, around the house to see if bacteria had survived their uh, cleaning routine. So it was not enough if your house looked clean. You have to demonstrate scientifically that the house was clean. There were no bacteria in the house. So the, house the housewife becomes like a, like a bacteriologist, and, and the house is her laboratory, which is kind of an upgrade on the housewife duties, if you think about it. But it's also kind of, uh, okay, now you are not only responsible for cleaning the house, but you, if somebody in your house uh, gets sick, it's your fault, right? You didn't eliminate sufficiently or efficiently enough uh, the bacteria. And this um, uh, first antibiotic, uh, in fact, is the first modern antibiotic, I will say, because in fact, it's important to remember that antibiotics were existing for many thousands of years before, and that we were stupid enough to kind of uh, uh, eliminate this uh, this fantastic uh, wealth of uh, of knowledge. This is in Hotep, for example, who was an e Egyptian uh, polymath. He, he knew everything. And basically, he was uh, a poet, a physician, a doctor, a mathematician, an astronomer, and even an architect. He actually is famous for his uh, step pyramid, is the first pyramid in Egypt. So it's very interesting that already in Egypt you have this coincidence of the architect and the doctor. But he's also very well remembered for his um, for his medical uh, treatises. He he was um, he, he was able to identify a number of uh, um, bacterial diseases like uh, this is four thousand uh, years before uh, 2000 years, sorry, before Hippocrates. So we always think that the birth of medicine is Hippocrates in, in Greece, but it's not. It's, um, it's in the uh, uh, 2600, more or less, BC years that Inhotep already uh, uh, was uh, identifying diseases like tuberculosis, appendicitis, gallbladder, arthritis, all kinds of diseases. But most important, he used to perform surgery uh, and, uh, and use uh, uh, moldy uh, bread to prevent infection. So already he was on penicillin before penicillin 
existed. Of course, it's also very important to think about all the um, uh, indigenous communities all over the world who has known for many, many uh, thousands of years that plants have antibacterial uh, properties. And here you have a selection of things from curry leaf to ginger to turmeric to all these things, coriander, all these uh, all these things that uh, that they know, and there are thousands of pl of plants like this that were plant medicine and had been used by all kinds of indigenous communities in North America, in South America, in India, in Australia, in New Zealand uh, uh, as antibiotics. So we are basically stupid. We are uh, coming around to find out in 1928 uh, that mold uh, can can kill bacteria, but uh, as you can say, Inhotep already knew uh, for a long uh, time. Anyway, so uh, going back to, to our stupidity, modern architecture channeled this antibiotic uh, approach following uh, Fleming and even anticipating uh, Fleming. Le Corbusier, for example, to mention a Swiss fellow, uh, obsessed entirely about bacteria, he quoted uh, counts of bacteria per cubic um, meter in the air. He describes himself, as you can see here, as a bacteriologist and architecture as a laboratory work. These are actually fragments from this a fragment from Precisions, a very well-known book, but people don't pay attention that he's saying these things. I tried to this is 1922 before, before uh, penicillin. And he's already speaking of doing laboratory work and isolating my micro, my micro. <laughs> I watched it develop the biology of my bro, bro. Then by an effort of synthesis, I drew up the principles of modern city planning. So the principles of modern city planning, according to him, come from his laboratory work and his isolation of the, of the micro. So um, how then you produce the idea of modern architecture? First, you have to demonize 19th century architecture as an unhealthy germ that needs to be eradicated. So here you have the uh, uh, poster of the Siedlung, of the uh, Bourbon Siedlung uh, in the Weissenhof in Stuttgart, very well known to all of you, I'm sure. But here you have the poster on the left, right? And what is this poster? Because normally in a poster you announce what you are going to do, right? A modern house like the one of Le Corbusier next to, the next, uh, next to it would have been appropriate, but no. They put exactly what they are not going to do, and what they are not going to do, the, the Red Cross, is this, uh, is this 19th century interior full of uh, staff, full of uh, uh, um, clothing, full of uh, brick brack, full of all these things that accumulate dust and create the seeds. So this, this, this idea that uh, we have to eliminate all of this and that white walls, ventilation, terraces for the sun, all of these have to be presented, were presented actually as antidotes, as architecture, if you want, sterilizers that will prevent uh, tuberculosis and other bacterial uh, disease. So in other words, modern architecture is modern uh, as long as it is free of bacteria. Okay? And, and here you have how these ideas persisted for such a long time, that is still in 1950, and this is the most important magazine in, in Spain at that time, the most important magazine of architecture, journal, I should say, the Revista Nacional de, de Arquitectura, still in 1952, could put in the cover an image of a modern building superimposed with the sun, okay? the sun is health, but also with an X-ray of the land. So what is this architecture trying to counter? He's trying to counter steel. It is trying to counter steel in 52, uh, the uh, uh, death by tuberculosis that was still prevalent because even if you need, it took a long time for the first antibiotic that was effective against tuberculosis to be discovered, it was uh, in the middle of the war, it was 1943, but then it took, because of the war and so many other things, it took uh, at least 10 years until this antibiotic was uh, put uh, into, into use in many parts of the world. So still in 1952, obviously people were dying from tuberculosis and architecture, for once we were useful, was the only established cure, as you know very well from Switzerland and all these... Uh, uh, sanatoriums in Davos and in the Semmerings and all these beautiful uh, 
things that you have. So the cure was architecture, right? The cure was the terraces for the sun, the ventilation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, it's not just um, uh, Le Corbusier, as we were talking about, but so many architects were obsessed about bacteria. They were real germaphobes, like Bucky Fuller, for example, huge germaphobe. His Diamaxion house was a kind of a sterilizing chamber filled with antibacterial devices and isolated from any contagion from the ground, from neighbors, or even from shared plumbing. So you see he has this uh, system which isolates the house from all the neighboring uh, uh, things. And you see that there is a doll there on this bed, and the doll is naked, so to speak. <laughs> His wife was embarrassed when he presented this model of the house in a department store, and, and he, co he tried to cover it with a kind of um, a hand handkerchief, uh, right? But the idea is that you won't have uh, bed clothing because the bed clothing also has bacteria, and, and the house is uh, sufficiently warm that you don't need any kind of blankets or sheets or anything like that. Um, Further to uh, the mid-century, in 1944, uh, the IMSS addressed what is a house. And, and you know, I was very surprised to listen to that because, of course, I love the IMSS, so colorful, so beautiful, so fantastic. But look at what they say. They argue in this article, what is a house, um, the, the fully industrialized post-war house that in 1944 they are already anticipating will be, listen to this, will be sprayed with chemicals every six months to make it totally free of insects. What? <laughs> Thomas Saracino will have a heart attack with all his spiders and everything. We now have become so much more sensitive to the insects and to the uh, um, animals in, in our house. Right. Um, they also argue for the for this what they call elect well they were called that way electronic precipitant uh, uh, devices and sterilizing lamps and here you have some drawings of the 1930s which they argue and the publicity of these uh, things already argue continuously remove bacteria from the air and these sterilization lamps which kill bacteria in water in foods in any surface so. You know, here it is the sterilizing lamp, uh, um, uh, sterilizing the, ki the the toys of little kids, etc. Right? <clears throat> Sorry. In many ways, then the house, the post-war house, is still at war in a way. So images of uh, of uh, enemy, they call the enemy uh, bacteria, are exploding, and we are using sterilizing lamps inside uh, domestic uh, spaces. At the end of the war, uh, advertisements promised that these lamps will kill all airborne bacteria and children, nurseries and living rooms. Uh, everything was to be continuously radiated. <coughs> Sorry, I have a little bit of a cough. Maybe I have some bacteria too. <coughs> if you go back, it's not just the Americans that are obsessed with, uh, with bacteria. If you go back to, to London and to the 1950s, this is the 1956 uh, Alison and Peter Smithson's House of the Future, where they say that all the food not only is wrapped in plastic, etc., but they argue that it's bombarded with gamma rays, which is an atomic uh, byproduct, they say, to kill bacteria. So the whole house is a hyper-clean uh, space, a kind of molded, a space uh, capsule enters through this. Uh, here is some images in the press, and you enter through this. Uh, through this, uh, it's, it's supposed to be a plastic uh, house, and you enter through this uh, so-called decontamination uh, chamber, in which the air uh, from the outside is eliminated, and all the contamination that you bring from the outside is eliminated, and you enter this clean uh, space where all the bacteria has been uh, eliminated. Yet, as you know very well, modern architecture for all these obsessions with sickness produce itself sickness. For example, you have heard about the sick syndrome uh, building where uh, the air conditioning systems that Le Corbusier celebrated so much uh, for isolating the inside air from the contaminated outside air, look at what he says, 
Bathiment hermetics, we know now that bathiment hermetics is a real problem, that the more <laughs> hermetic, it's, uh, hermetic is, a, is a building, the more health problems you're going to have uh, inside. But they were really convinced that this was the future, that we have an, uh, an hermetic uh, uh, building uh, um, with the air continuously cleaned by air conditioning. Of course, this produced, uh, as I say, the sick syndrome building that was discovered in the 19th uh, uh, 70s, but it turned out to be that this was just the tip uh, of the iceberg, that there are many other uh, diseases, as we will see in a minute, uh, that are produced uh, uh, in recent years by this uh, obsessive elimination of bacteria. But even more, you can argue that illness and architecture are really inseparable. They have never been uh, a distinction. Every architecture from the Neolithic times has produced sickness, and, and this already actually expressed very clearly in this health exhibition in London that I just showed you before the images of the poster and some interiors. This is the, the publication that I mentioned that was published in connection with the exhibition of, of our homes and how to make them healthy. healthy. And it's interesting that it's, uh, it's the writers are architects and doctors, so still we are in a time in which there was this incredible collaboration, which unfortunately we have lost and we need to, to recover. Um, but anyway, in the introduction to this book, this fellow, Benjamin Gore Richardson, which is a doctor, writes, and I'm going to read only the second part of the, of the quote, that man in constructing protection from exposure has constructed the conditions of disease so that the moment that we went indoors, you not know, the moment we were living in caves or in, 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 in baskets, basically, uh, but the moment we really build walls around ourselves, we can produce conditions, the conditions for diseases that did not exist before. It's kind of interesting that he say that in that moment, because that can be, uh, has been demonstrated in more recent uh, times, where you can see here, for example, the Neolithic uh, skeleton that was discovered a few years ago, uh, and this uh, skeleton has been deformed by tuberculosis. So already you can see that illnesses like tuberculosis become uh, dominant already in the, uh, in the Neolithic, the moment we went uh, indoors. But going back to our question about bacteria and to more recent problems that we have created with our architecture and with our um, uh, attitude towards uh, towards antibiotics and, and, and towards health, reducing um, the diversity of, of bacteria has been a complete disaster uh, uh, for humans. It turns out to be that buildings are kind of an expanded gut and that reducing this diversity is a huge problem. Buildings have apparently their own uh, microbiome. Imagine that. So it's not just they have a microbiome. Buildings also have a microbiome. And the diversity of bacteria in spaces is just as important as the diversity in the gut. So we hear a lot about the diversity in the gut, uh, or health, how do we should take probiotics or prebiotics or both, etc. But we never hear as architects that the buildings have actually a microbiome. And that the bacteria of the building continuously enters the human body and the bacteria on the human is spread uh, around the, the building too along with that of other fellow humans, other animals, insects, plants, etc. And again, there is no strict line between the body and the building. In fact, a building is really a kind of an expanded uh, gut. Uh, uh, we are currently, and when I say we, is my uh, partner, uh, Mark, w Mark Wigley, and myself, we are working with uh, uh, an interdisciplinary group of scientists on the microbiome of the built environment, precisely. And one of these um, people in the team is a microbial ecologist, Maria Gonzalez uh, Dominguez Bello. Uh, she is from uh, Venezuela, but she's based in the United States. And she has uh, able, have been able to crack something that was always a mystery for the medical establishment, which is why uh, babies born of the Sarian have uh, uh, health problems a year after they were born. Well, she was able to demonstrate that a baby that is born out of cesarea, a year after they are born, they still carry the microbiome of the room in which they were born instead of the of the mother. So that when you pass through the 
uh, uh, when the baby passes through the beneficial uh, bacteria in the vaginal uh, uh, in the in the vaginal canal, uh, you are uh, kind of swabbed with all kinds of uh, beneficial bacteria. And these poor kids, if they happen to be born in a in a, in one of these supposedly sterile uh, uh, um, uh, operating rooms, which in fact they have a lot of uh, bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics. It turns out to be that a year later they may have huge problems that nobody could understand because they have picked up the bacteria that was in the in the room. Uh, so these supposedly sterilized uh, rooms are uh, in hospitals are really filled with bacteria, which explains why uh, now it's kind of clearly demonstrated that many people um, die when they go to hospital for some stupid little thing. They die for things that have nothing to do with what they came in with. They die from something they pick up in the hospital, which is these uh, really mega bugs that are resistant uh, to antibiotics. So they are trying to counter this problem uh, by wiping uh, the bacteria from the mother's vagina uh, onto the baby's uh, body that are born of, uh, of, uh, of the chariot to see whether that will, will, uh, will improve uh, the situation. So basically what I'm trying to say is that lack of diversity in our bacteria is a killer. And this uh, lack of diversity of, uh, of bacteria is, of course, uh, caused by the overuse of uh, antibiotics uh, from junk food and from bad architecture uh, too, as we were uh, just uh, uh, talking about the way in which these uh, hermetic buildings uh, foster the, um, the uh, growth of uh, bacteria. So this invisible extinction uh, of microbes, of, of bacteria, is harming uh, human health. I mean, in fact, it has been uh, recently discovered that many of the, of the health problems of our time, like obesity and certain forms of cancer, autoimmune diseases, many of these things, even as I say, uh, depression, are caused precisely from um, lack of diversity in, in bacteria. And there have been many attempts to uh, do what they call fecal uh, implants to treat uh, intractable problems such as uh, their experiments treating autism in kids, their experiments treating people, all people with Alzheimer's, all kinds of, uh, of digestive uh, problems that people have have been also using fecal implants. But it's not just that, because as you, as the next one, that I want to talk about is Martin Glesser, another scientist that is um, in our team, and he talks about the silent extinction of microbes. And uh, he's the man that wrote also the book, Let Them Eat Dirt, about uh, children and how you should let them actually uh, eat dirt. And, 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 you know, this mania of the super clean environments and super uh, anti bacterial shops and all of that is creating a lot of problems in, in kids as well. He argues that the, the diminishing diversity of the human microbiome is a bigger threat to the species than climate change. Okay, you have heard this first, right? I mean, this is incredible because uh, where we are uh, very conscious about all the ways in which architecture contributes to climate change, uh, and trying in many ways to 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 come up with with uh, solutions, very many of of them quite uh, remarkably inventive. You will hear very few architects that are interested in the question of the microbiome and the and the way in which this is a major threat to their species, to our species. Uh, it's also to be that indigenous uh, um, tribes in the Amazon have the most diverse uh, microbiome on the planet. And Maria Gonzalez Bello and Martin Blesser, for example, have started to collect seed in the deep forest to establish a World Bank of, of, uh, of bacteria, the bacteria that we have, have already lost. And, and here you have um, uh, Maria in, in the Amazon looking at these samples that the community have uh, given her. It's kind of funny when you hear her talking about how these people tell her, you mean you came all the way <laughs> here to, to, to collect our seed. <laughs> and of course, we are dependent now on them. And they, uh, in the sense that even if I was saying before, 
they are trying to to use the 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 bacteria in the vagina of the mother to to kind of ameliorate the the health of these uh, newborn babies by cesarean, they may not be enough because we don't have that bacteria anymore. We have eliminated to the extent that uh, many scientists in different parts of the world are collecting uh, this bacteria um, basically from indigenous uh, communities and they're establishing a bank of bacteria in all places where, in Switzerland, of course, so, you know, <laughs> where could it be, right? Um, so for us, then the question is, what could be a probiotic uh, architecture? And of course, a probiotic architecture will be more like our gut. It will be more porous versus the kind of prophylactic attitude of modern architecture. Because the immune system doesn't key, simply keep foreigners uh, uh, or foreign organisms out. It regulates a kind of dynamic balance between inside and outside, right? Architecture, too, could be a way of bringing the other in. The very idea of shelter could change from keeping dangers out to bringing the dangers in, right? So to really shelter uh, the species means exposing uh, the species to multiple others. And this might be um, a kind of a trans-species uh, design, right? This may mean experimenting with the idea of, in a way, of rewilding the interior. We used to live intimately with all the bacteria of the soil, the plants, and other animals, and we may want to 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 reconnect with this diversity of bacteria, embracing, if you want, all these uh, uh, these forms of uh, of life. And then the question for us is also: Is there any kind of precedent? Uh, for a probiotic architecture that fosters trans-species collaborations, trans-species uh, communities. And we actually find uh, 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 clues precisely in the work of, uh, of uh, Lina Bobardi, which you can see here in her glass house in, in Sao Paulo, eh? surrounded by, by, uh, by plants, her Casa de Vidro eh? in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, when she designed this house, which is, as you know, suspended in the forest like a kind of, uh, of tree house, what people don't pay attention is that among all these drawings that she did for the house, she also drew every insect, every plant, and every animal living in the side of the house with the same precision that, that she draws the building. So for her, it is like she, they are part of the building. She acknowledges all the existing inhabitants uh, that are already in the site and wants to preserve uh, uh, the site for them. One well, doesn't want, like all architects, to eliminate their existence, but actually the opposite, try to make an architecture that keeps them in. So if all architecture is about keeping uh, bugs, uh, insects, uh, uh, <laughs> spiders uh, out, Lina is already, from the 1950s, embracing this... Uh, this uh, trans species, if you want, architecture where insects are not uh, the enemy but are intelligent uh, members of the community and humans are just uh, temporary uh, guests. He made exhibitions even for children like this in Teatro uh, for Crianzas in Sao Paulo. She makes these fantastic uh, drawings of uh, explaining to, to kids that you shouldn't step on. on on ants or on spiders or on cockroaches, but on, on the contrary, respect them. So this is a beautiful illustration of uh, of this. She imagines spaces in which insects, animals, and plants are the real occupants. Uh, she's always blurring, as you know, the lines between uh, inside uh, and outside. And even when she does uh, major buildings like this uh, fantastic uh, museum of uh, of uh, of art in Sao Paulo, this massive uh, 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 building, she's also kind of drawing as, as, as if it was already eaten by by plants. So it, she's already imagining spaces in which uh, humans uh, and plants and and insects and animals are 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 are, are collaborating, are living uh, together. In fact, if you think about it, she imagines spaces in which the human is always secondary in the sense that the plants of uh, <laughs> Lina Bobardi house are still there, but she's no longer there, or Bardi is no longer there. So 
we will be survived by those, all these animals and all these insects. And and so in a, in fact, the idea then is that the human is just kind of a visitor, is a fragile uh, visitor that depends on these other forms of life actually to survive. And and uh, and this is uh, in many ways part of our political ethic of of celebrating and learning from all uh, species. In other words, this is uh, a kind of trans-species uh, architecture which we could think about. Of course, there may be also other contemporary architects that we think about, but since I'm a historian, I always try to go to the historian uh, <laughs> side of things and try to figure it out how to um, um, learn from, from history. Thank you so much. Maybe I should stop sharing the screen so that you see me better, right? Yes. Is me better? Do I see? Me. Do I see you? Uh, okay. We see you now perfectly, Beatriz. It was okay. Just... Okay. 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 Great. Great. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sofia. Please go ahead. I I talk too much. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Thank you. I think it was. Uh... So interesting and so relevant because as you kind of pointed out throughout also our perception of bacteria is maybe has shifted through the years, but it has shifted once again with the COVID-19 pandemic. So yes. now maybe going, retracting even more into this kind of uh, our shells and seeing it, as you said, as the enemy. So... Yeah, in many ways, uh, in many ways, we went back to. I don't know why my computer stopped doing this. Let me see if I get up here. Okay, and I see you better. Yes, yes, this is the the situation that. Um, okay, now I see you better. Um, that uh, with COVID, in many ways, we uh, uh, started to have the same. Uh, it turned out that modern architecture was good for COVID. Why? Because we could open the windows, we could uh, we have terraces, we went outside. Because many of the obsessions of the of the early 20th century uh, actually like washing your hands and and um, and and using antiseptic things and all of this was very important to combat uh, COVID. But now what is happening? Now it turns out to be I read the other day in the New York Times. Why is it that people are getting so sick? You're getting so sick for the stupid things like a cold that doesn't go away, a cough that doesn't go away. It turns out to be that this was very good for COVID. But in the meantime, we have um, uh, reduced our capacity to react to normal pathogens like a cold or a sore throat or a little cough or something. It's also psychological because before we had a cold and we go like, okay, you know, you shrug it off and you go to work and whatever and spread it around. Some people got it. Some people with good immune system didn't get it, and that was uh, that was good because you were exposed to the to the bacteria, and your immune system was mm -hmm, operating constantly. Now we are all uh, like we have a little bit of the sniffles. Ah, we don't go to work because I mean, how can you do that to other people? We have become, we have become so sensitive that in this year finally we dis discover that actually, at least in New York, there are tons of people with calls that never go away. So our immune system has been kind of suppressed to the stand, and also because we spend so much time indoors and so, that we are not, uh, we have to recover the, that diversity of, of bacteria in order to, to counter uh, normal threats like a regular, you know, um, call, uh, etc. So the COVID didn't help the uh, diversity of bacteria a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. This the problem was before uh, uh, before uh, COVID, but in many ways, as you know, COVID was also uh, is also a, dis a disease that we have uh, brought into ourselves. That it cannot be separated from the climate change and from all the questions that we were discussing uh, before about the elimination of of. Um, of good bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was also interesting that you brought in like a, a cultural perspective because mm -hmm. I, I have like a personal experience with, I grew up in Mexico City and I didn't mm -hmm. know many people that were allergic to things. Yes. And I moved to Canada and all of yes. a sudden 
so many of my classmates are allergic to peanuts, like deadly allergies. Yes. If they are in the same room as a peanut, they can go to the hospital. So it was so confusing to me. And then I yes. used to understand a bit of this isolation, the separation that, that you talk about, the sterilization of space to the point that like we're no longer even able to live in the same spaces that we we used yeah. to. Yeah. Yes, you are totally right. The the incredible amount of allergies all over the the the, the so-called Western uh, world is related to this mania of the cleaning and and uh, antiseptic this and you know and they, they you know they basically they isolate the kids to such an extent that they have created this problem. When I grew up, nobody had allergies. Nobody in my school had allergies, and I asked all my friends. Nobody had allergies. It doesn't matter whether you are in the United States or in New Zealand or in or in Spain. And and now the whole uh, the whole developing world is full of uh, allergies and and other th other problems that are inexplicable. You want to tell me what is the right the this crazy thing with the uh, increase in the number of autism or in the case of all kinds of autoimmune disorders in adults too? What is that about, right? And when we have to learn a lot and, and think about all the forms of medicine that we knew before modern medicine was invented. And that's why I think many people are going back to even serious uh, scientific places in the in, at the cutting edge of research, like the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital in, in you know, treating the most uh, 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 untreatable forms of cancer. They know pretty well, you know. You know, I know from people that have had to go through through the process, they offer also alternative forms of medicine in collaboration with whatever they need to do, right? So you may be having radiation or chemotherapy or, I don't know, or an operation, but they also a team that ha is giving you, I don't know, homeopathic things and uh, yoga and all forms of uh, of relating to, to the world. And that is actually acknowledging that we have this incredible depth of knowledge for all these thousands of years, and we, we were so stupid to eliminate it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, uh... um, oh, yeah, oh. please go ahead. I, I was not ready yet, but... Oh. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe I have a question to elaborate on this topic of the uh, autoimmune uh, uh, problems in the in the so-called Western world because of an intensification of medical care over the last uh, kind of centuries. And coming back to the to the case of your collaborator at the laboratory, kind of doing research in indigenous communities, etc. Could we get to a point in which, like, bacteria uh, not only could transform the domestic and interior spaces, but also on a transnational level, uh, there could be a deficit of certain bacteria in certain kind of locations. And therefore, they could be seen as an asset in the same way we are now talking of raw, raw minerals for uh, for the making of mobile phones and other forms of technology. And could we see uh, on an international level like political clashes and uh, conditions of geopolitical instability because of the trade of bacteria? Uh, well, yeah, you're right. I mean, they are an incredible source of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge and of bacteria. Uh, um, these uh, uh, indigenous communities in the Amazon, for example, have the richest uh, microbiome. Uh, a woman uh, architect whose name I don't remember now. Uh, well, anyway, she was uh, she was uh, going through different parts of the world, producing a new, uh, presenting a new system of cleaning uh, water, a, a kind of portable way of. Uh, of cleaning water, and she went to the Amazon, and they say we we don't need that, and 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 uh, why do you don't need? They don't need it because that's a problem for you. They say every time somebody visits from another part of the world, they get sick. We don't. No, nobody gets sick there. Why? Because they have uh, such good bacteria, had such good microbiome that even if the water is contaminated, it doesn't matter. They, it doesn't get them sick. It gets sick you. You know, we go there and we get sick, but they don't get sick at all. So they have the richest uh, microbiome, and that's why they, which is, they are very careful. Um, these uh, 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 people, because they are, uh, they they are very very careful of informing the community of what they are doing and why they are doing. And these uh, communities are also laughing at the fact that they are collecting the seed, etc., etc. They are establishing a bank of of bacteria 
it's not like the rare minerals that uh, it, it become um, uh, 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 rare. It it is it is a little bit more like the seeds bank, you know. You mm -hmm. can collect it now before it's too late because uh, the reality is that uh, many indigenous communities, the moment they are closer to um, uh, Western kind of food and so on, so they lose the microbiome immediately and they start developing obesity and things that they don't have at all in their own in their own culture and in their own communities. So it's clearly related. Uh, uh, to our ways of, of life. So that's why they are collecting this uh, this microbiome because they feel like if we don't do this quickly, it will also be extinct. So it's a different problem, I suppose, okay. than the... But it's a very good question because it, in many ways is the is it has the same uh, uh, thing that we need to go on now to other parts of the of the world to, mm -hmm. to scavenge for... for uh, for what we need for our survival is pathetic, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I suppose it's, uh, yeah. Uh, um, something to continue. Well, when talking about the, I mean, about uh, this uh, bacteria, bacteria that is not longer available in our context. Uh, mm -hmm. And then when looking back at the drawings of Lina Bobardi and her house and mm -hmm. her context, uh, all of a sudden, the factor of um, situated trans-species architecture. Uh, I mean, I was thinking at how if I was if I was going to do a similar exercise of my house in Madrid. The I mean, the walls could be pretty much uh, the same. The height. There's certain architectural parameters, but all of a sudden, if I had to draw uh, who I am going to share my house with. It will be such a different uh, trans-species architecture, and I think yeah. it's incredibly rich to understand that all of a sudden, uh, architecture, interior architecture, also could uh, add, could gain a lot of value by mm -hmm. being extremely situated and by acknowledging really, really well the kind of bacteria and the kind of animals that I will be sharing a spe space with. Uh, because right. I, was, I was looking romantically to those drawings of, of Lina Bobardi, and then all mm. of a sudden I realized, well, Madrid is not tropical. I don't <laughs> think I will have that many vegetation around. <laughs> I don't think I can, I can, I mean, I might have like a third of the, of the you know, of the <laughs> biome of possibilities, but still it's, an, it's, a, it's a first step, so... Right, right. You know, I was born in Madrid, you know, so I'm totally, you know, and imagine New York is even more extreme. But, you know, the reality is that in Madrid, the majority of people live in flats, right? But it still applies, you know, because if you, if you remember, Lina um, uh, grew up in, in, uh, in Italy and, and uh, in Rome, actually, and then went to work in, in Milan with Gio Ponti and made all these little uh, uh, magazines, collaborated with Thomas, but also all these other magazines that we know, don't know so much about it. But with my partner, uh, Mark Wigley, we have been looking into it in great detail because we are also working on a book on Lina Bobardi and this idea of the trans-species architecture. And it turns out to be that she had already that attitude in Milan Right, so if you think that this is just the tropical, well, the tropical offer her a lot of other animals that she didn't know, other insects that she was not familiar with. But in 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 Milan, she's already drawing in great detail all the plants and all the little insects and all of that. And of course, artists like Saracino has been um, Thomas Saracino, who is originally from from Buenos Aires, but. Um, I met him actually like <laughs> like the previous uh, uh, somebody in your previous panel in Frankfurt at the Stadel, where he came to to study architecture uh, and 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 then uh, Mark and I have him in in our classes at the at the Stadel, and he ended up doing doing art uh, because the Stadel had both at that point architecture and art anyway. Uh, he's been arguing for years that we shouldn't kill the spiders, that the spiders are our friends, that we that they are very intelligent uh, animals and actually they rid us of a lot of insects in a natural way without having us to irradiate the house as the imps wanted us or to use insecticides that are cancerigenous, etc., etc. So many artists have had this attitude. I think uh, I think we need to bring this more into the world of architecture because the impact of uh, modern architecture and the mania of the sterilizing white uh, 
a world in which nothing uh, passes, uh, well, maybe we have created a problem and we couldn't reach in any situation the diversity of uh, of uh, species in our in our environment. <laughs> I'm not arguing that you let the the mice run around your apartment, but you know what what I'm saying. You don't need to use so many uh, antiseptic soaps and and be so maniatic about a little glitter here and there. Plants are fantastic. I mean, NASA has known for years how fantastic plants are to clean the air, right? And how long has it taken us to realize, oh, yeah, plants are good? Well, Lina Bobardi knew uh, already how important plants uh, were before NASA knew, before NASA existed. Mm -hmm. Not only for the mood, but also for cleaning the air. If you look at the Bauhaus and, and another fellow born in, uh, in Madrid, Ivan Lopez uh, Munuera, did a paper at Princeton, very interesting, also on how the Bauhaus uh, uh, use of plants. They all have plants. If you look at the at the students and uh, how they arrange their spaces, they already knew. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of intuitive uh, uh, knowledge about uh, what is good. And it's you... something you can see now in what is considered like a modern architecture of biophilia of yes. plants and. Uh, hospitals or in like treatment uh, facilities but as you said it's something that many people already knew and were already practicing and even yes. before um, Bauhaus and before like we, yes. we had an understanding of this relationship with plants but yeah. right and with animals I mean we live we used to live in close proximity with plants with animals and insects and all these things and it turned out to be that that was healthier uh, Mm -hmm. uh, for us in, in many ways. I'm not saying, I mean, I think, you know, I think antibiotics are very good when you have a terrible infection and, and you have to get rid of it. It's the overuse of antibiotic that has created a problem. Likewise, I think modern architecture was fantastic in a moment in which there were no antibiotics in uh, helping humanity uh, because it, it really was effective, and, and for once we did something useful, uh, as I say, right? But as, as with antibiotics, we overdid it. We overdid it and created a problem that was not there before, or was not there to the extent that, that we created. Because as this doctor in the 1882 says, no, no, the conditions for disease we created the moment we created architecture, right? So it's almost in, inseparable. We have... Uh, in going indoors as humanity, we have cre we created the conditions of forms of disease that were not existing or not prevalent before. We are not going to go back to the caves, right? But we have to survive. Right? Mm, yeah. Oh, Roberto, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. No, but um, now maybe there's a suggestion that not go against your lecture, but it was a an opposite um, uh, consequence about the you the bad use of bacteria in domestic uh, situation. I think for this famous uh, Russian attack and killing about um, this um, father and daughter, no, and all mm -hmm. the spies, uh, Russian spies, uh, and, and all this mythology about the use of bacteria. In um, as as a form of attack, uh, yeah. of terroristic and others. Since uh, I don't know, so I think to um, show that um, Alexander, yes. that you know very well about spies and about right, them. right. So yeah, this side maybe it's not a critique, but just maybe another way to look at that. That in a perverse right. uh, relation right. with we have with them, right, the right. Right, of course, there is uh, there is deadly bacteria. Bacteria has been used as a uh, weapon uh, in war. Uh, bacteria has been studied uh, extensively for for uh, as a as a weapon, as a bio weapon, mm -hmm. as you as you know. The, this is actually is a bio weapon because it's not treatable with antibiotics. <laughs> so the enemy is uh, is uh, is uh, it's not. The bacteria in its in itself, but the way in which it has been weaponized, right? Uh, and and we precisely is a, is a serious problem because we don't have the counter 
I mean, if it was a bacteria that you could treat with an antibiotic, then you could say, okay, yeah, they got infected, but we got them to the hospital on time, etc. No, it's really hard. It's really very difficult. So it's not the other side of the of the problem. The other side of the problem could be say, well, you know, there are real infections that you need to 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 get antibiotics for. Yeah, sure. Those is clearly the case. You need to do it. Hmm. Chemotherapy is also poisonous, but there are times that you need to do it. And, and that's it. And hmm. either that or you don't leave, right? And then you can do many other um, uh, alternative forms to kind of recover your your body. So Western medicine has a lot of very positive things. Uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Catering, to go back to that, is saving lives uh, every day. Uh, all kinds of uh, 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 places and research uh, centers and hospitals are doing miracles for people with uh, deadly uh, diseases. The question is when we medicalize everyday life, when we use medical soap uh, on a regular basis, when we take antibiotics for a little cold, when we know actually it doesn't work for the cold. Uh, uh, you know, we have created a situation uh, in which we have made ourselves more sick uh, than we needed to be. In the name of health, we think that that's good, that we want to protect our children from bacteria, well, up to a point, right? It turns out to be that it's very dangerous. Mm. Maybe I have Why a solid? question uh, before we, we move into the next thing. Um, I was, while well, looking at your presentation, like most of the materials you have presented are drawings or photographs in terms of the architectural medium. And I was just considering that uh, drawing has been the dominating medium of architectural thinking uh, over the last 500 years, since the Renaissance particularly. And I was thinking, do you think that this new discourse about the post-human, the post-anthropocentrism, trans-species, multi-species architecture could also change or create a more diversified uh, plethora of means and mediums to uh, think architecture? Of course, of course. You know, I'm completely you know, open to all forms of, uh, of, uh, of representation. Architecture has always been, been uh, uh, this. I mean, architecture has always uh, employed um, writing and uh, telling mm -hmm. stories uh, from Vitruvius to our time, from uh, 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 drawings and models. I mean, with each uh, new development, uh, the inventions of new forms of uh, drawing, like perspective, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The introduction of the of the computer into architecture with its new uh, technology, which is architecture, is always there in the in the cutting, in the cutting edge after medicine. I was always very struck when, for the first time in uh, El Croquis. Uh, Alejandro Taira Polo was interviewing um, uh, Frank Gehry, who was the first architect to have uh, a computers in in uh, in his office, and he's like so uh, surprised because he never seen anything like that. So he said, "Where do you get that?" And he's interviewing actually the technical team around Frank Gehry's mm -hmm. office. I'm sure Frank Gehry doesn't understand how the computer works anyway, or didn't at that time. Anyway. So they say they got these uh, uh, 3D uh, digitizers from the local um, uh, hospital that was using them for brain surgery. And, and they now had an, a, a, a new model and they kind of uh, uh, gave them to, to Frank Gehry that was using it to, to uh, envision 3D. Uh, modeling with these three digitizers that were used for brain surgery before. Mm -hmm. So we are always not only um, theoretically and uh, uh, and conceptually uh, dependent on medicine and on the latest understanding of the body from the point of view also medicine, but also technologically from all the tools that uh, are used in medicine. So I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Medicine is using extensively AI right now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and other forms of intelligence. Maybe we can learn something too. Point of view. Also, medicine. Yeah, there's um, uh, something, just a, a little thing. Uh, I, I really like this topic that you brought to the table. First, uh, as uh, from a post-natural point of view, um, trans species, it's, uh, it's a must in my daily, my daily dictionary. Um, and also... Um, we, we did uh, some time ago, well, we started researching into this topic because uh, the way design has, has sterilized 
or how we ha we live in a de-sterilizing design nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been uh, a really like repeating topic, uh, uh, you know, to to start or, or to to rethink, um, you know, coexistence from a yeah. from an, uh, you know to rethink coexistence and. When also, um, you know, jumping to Javier's and how we render or how are we going to draw or to start thinking and start representing contemporary uh, architecture when we jump into trans species architecture, I will, I really, I would love to, or I think it's important to go back to the moment in which Coke and Pasteur looked through their micro uh, microscope mm -hmm. and saw and, and saw rend and they rendered visible the first bacteria ever. Yeah. That is, um, you know, a crucial point in which, I mean, of course, they didn't know to tell the difference between path pathogens or good bacteria, but they were yeah. rendered visible. Now yes. we can tell apart. So let's jump into a new microscope. And here I want to throw, uh, you know, to break a window and say, let's use, for example, Lee Margulis microscope oh. mm -hmm. that is not only able to see at microbes, but is able to see symbiotic relations, is able to see coexistence. So okay. how are uh, bacteria rendered through Limargulis site? So mm -hmm. that could be maybe a first step into, into looking at how architecture could be could be represented when dealing on, on coexistence and multi-species. I don't okay. know. It's, uh, I mean, it's no, a... no, it's, it's totally correct. It's totally correct. Architecture is always so interested in everything else that is happening yeah. in the world, right? So the invention of mi the microscope, of course, uh, uh, had an enormous impact on, on architects and, and the way they start thinking uh, about their world, right? So all of a sudden, all this discussion of the micro and the, and the micro is completely related to the space program and the, and the microscope. All of a sudden, you know, think about powers of 10. Right. Yeah. I mean, those are architects, right? And architects tend to do a film and you go, you go inside of the, of the hand, the, 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 the wrist of that person lying on a par in Chicago to, uh, at the cellular level, to the microscopic level, to the, da, 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 to the maximum of what they could see. And then they go up into, into, into space to the maximum of what could be made visible at that time. Well, that demonstrates. It's, it's one clear de demonstration of the impact that technologies of uh, of vision had on architecture historically, right? And and uh, we are still there, and we will never leave that. So this is uh, <laughs> this is uh, uh, not necessarily related to the to the to the to the bacteria, but it is part of what architecture. Is I mean one of the beautiful things about architecture is how curious we are about everything else, right? I mean we read about everything. I'm particularly fascinated with medicine, but people are fascinated with all kinds of uh, of uh, developments in in the world, and constantly we are thinking about how that is affecting our architecture. In that sense, the architect is also an intellectual, a philosopher, you know. Uh, it, it goes back to, to what Vitruvius says, that the architect is somebody who knows uh, a little bit about everything, right? And and we are like so... I mean, I don't know any other profession that is so curious about everything, right? Everything new, everything that is being, you know... And particularly technologies of, of vision are very, very significant. Um, well, um, Beatriz... Uh, we are, uh, I think, running on time, and we uh, we are also we also have um, Liam Young, which uh, who is oh, going... he's coming now. Yes, but I mean, of course, we have uh, time to to say goodbye. There's actually one question that I skipped. Uh, there's okay. someone on on the public asking for the name of the scientist uh, that you were uh, in contact with uh, regarding the research on bacteria. Um, oh, the... they were two. I mentioned two: Maria Gonzalez Bello. And Martin Blazer. Martin Blazer, uh, you look through, let them eat dirt, let them eat dirt. Let, Martin Blazer is B-L-A-S-S-E-R. Yeah. And Maria Gonzalez Bello, well, anybody that is yeah. Spanish know how to pronounce to say that. <laughs> Bello is with a B. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, Maria Gonzalez Bello and Martin Blazer. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so they are in Rutgers, Rutgers University. Okay, Rutgers. Yes, 
al Rutgers, por you. Yeah, Rutgers, yeah. And I just send it to Lorena Solis Bravo that will be really thankful for, for getting these names. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, well, Beatriz... But there are many more. It's a, it's a team of like 40 people. We uh, we meet in different places of the world. They are from all over the place. I just happened to, to mention them because it was uh, important to the argument I was making about the microbiome of the built of the environment in the case of Maria and the uh, silent ex extinction of microbes of Martin. Yeah. But wow. there is Thomas Bors that I met in, in Germany, in Berlin. There are so many great uh, scientists, biologists, uh, ethnographists, uh, archaeologists, I mean, all kinds of <laughs> anthropologists, uh, all kinds of uh, scientists collaborating. And Mark and I are the only architects in the in the in the team because uh, I met them in in Berlin where I was a fellow in an institution and and then we start thinking about why architects are not anymore interested in this question as a one well, I don't know but you know we could um, and I don't think that's correct I think more people are getting interested since mm -hmm. then you know we are talking about more than um, six years ago that we seven years ago that we are collaborating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, Beatriz, it was a pleasure having you. It was a pleasure uh, expanding the notion of interior ecologies and opening the windows and doors to mm -hmm. new companions, uh, especially the tiny ones that really make part of uh, of us. Uh, as a fun fact, I think we have more weight of bacteria in our bodies than brain. We have about yes. kilos of bacteria in our body, and our brain is less. So yes. I mean, there goes a there goes a <laughs> a good thing to balance there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, thank okay. you. Okay, so uh, I leave you, and and thank you so much. I'll maybe I'll I'll stay a little bit and hear uh, Liam, but uh, it was nice to meet you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 And uh, I leave the floor to, well, actually, yes. Um, well, we count, uh, we welcome Liam Young today. Here we are, Liam, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us. For those um, um, that were not here yesterday, uh, because uh, we, we are doing a two-day um, two-day conference. Yesterday, we had the pleasure to to uh, to have uh, Liam Young's contribution. Um, Liam um, Young, well, his contribution was a uh, was a video that we played. Thank you very much. It was at the end of the of the day, uh, so it was a really nice way of just sitting down, like diving dive into the storytelling, into the narrative of a uh, of a uh, hopefully uh, of a hoping a future. Um, as Liam couldn't make it yesterday, um, uh, he was kind enough to join us today, and and you know, um, so we could uh, jump a little bit into a Q and A or or looking uh, into into his work. I will do a really brief introduction as um, as for for the people that wasn't here yesterday. Um, we come today with Liam Young, visionary. Um, uh, uh, futuristic storytelling and speculative design designer with a versatile career spanning directly to screenwriting. Liam is a renowned for his unique ability to shape extraordinary vision of the future through his work. His creations take us through captivating and at the same time provocative futuristic worlds, prompting us to reflect on the intricate connections between humanity, technology and the environment. Today, we will immerse ourselves in his speculative narrative uh, universe exploring the crucial role of design and technology in the digital ecologies of tomorrow. This is the presentation that we had uh, ready for yesterday uh, before jumping into Planet uh, City. Um, as today, uh, I mean, we are not planning on, on playing the 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 whole uh, Planet City, the, the, the clip that you send us. Um, I think that the idea was to uh, to invite you, Liam, and, and just have a, a chat on, on the tool of speculative design, for example, uh, which is uh, something that I, I encourage people to experiment as uh, I've been doing 
a few a few seminars on speculative design and i would like to ask you straight away um when did you when did you first encounter uh or how was your first approach to a speculate a speculation uh as a you know as a tool to um to create a new like new futures because it's not so common to jump into speculation, especially from design, because it's been usually quite the opposite. Design has usually tend us to go into a more productive, a more efficient kind of design that is focused on material realities. And how and how was your approach? How was your jump into speculation? Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I'm not sure I agree. I, I think architects mm -hmm. uh, and designers have always speculated. Right. Um, at, at different points, we call it something uh, something different, maybe. Uh, I mean, you know, Lido was a speculative architect, I think, right? Um, uh, speculation made sense in the 60s and 70s with, you know, Akizoo, Akigram, Super Studio, and so on. Um and I guess I think it makes sense again, you know, in the context of all the climate uh, crisis that we're face, um, the world turned on its head. Speculation now more than ever is a necessary act. I think, you know, when I talk about speculative architecture as a practice, I guess what I'm doing is trying to differentiate itself from the more general act of speculation that I think has always been a part of architectural history in that, for me, speculative architecture sees the speculation, the fiction, the story as an endpoint in and of itself. Um, a lot of times, you know, in the 80s, the, the time of the paper architects, you could call that speculative architecture as well. But that was a point where no one could really build anything. And it kind of made sense to, to make work on paper because there weren't, there wasn't any money in the system to produce architecture. And inevitably, those architects, when there was money coming towards their practices started building um when an architect speculates in, in a competition phase um their speculation is seen as being something you do on the journey to making a material reality um and again speculative architecture i think sees the fiction not as something you do hopefully to try and win a commission or to seduce a client uh, or to bid create a build project, but rather to, um, because the fiction is something you want to launch into the world with enough force that it might find traction in and of itself. Um, and that's what I do. Uh, I make films, I, I create imaginary worlds, not as a way to, to try and win a project, um, not as something to do in between uh, a client calling me up and, and asking for a house extension, but rather uh, because I think that fiction plays this incredible role in the world and our worldview is in many ways shaped and defined through the mediums of fiction. Um, uh, how did I come to it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, my, my early days, I started out, you know, as part of the star architect system, working for studios like Zaha Hadid. And I guess I quite quickly realized that the problems of the world um, were not being sufficiently engaged with through that mode of production. You know, architecture, unfortunately, requires an enormous amount of capital to, to, to mobilize it in a traditional sense, which inevitably means that the architect, for the most part, is in the service of those with capital or with enough power to, to employ them. So those star architects end up making trophies for the mega rich, um, iconic buildings for despots, and when the systems that were shaping and defining cities started to migrate towards the network, mobile technologies, things that existed outside of the remit of, of traditional architecture, then my practice started to move more and more towards speculation, um, particularly because those technologies that I wanted to deal with that I thought were constructive of urban experiences and spatial um, relationships um were coming at us faster than our cultural capacity to understand what they might mean was, I call them before culture technologies. And that meant that speculation played a critical role because you could start to prototype the cultural, um, political implications of those emerging technologies before they might have arrived. Um, and then 
uh, the rest is history, I guess. Yes, yeah, so um, I mean, the, the, the reason of this question is because uh, for many students that are out there right now studying architecture and, um, you know, when looking at the, the closest future of architecture or design, Many, many, um, many schools actually. Uh, where, uh, I mean, I'm lucky to be within an institution, mine, and also within head that really gives a voice to speculation. Uh, many, I mean, it's not so common that specula specula speculation has such a big voice. And for me, and as you said, uh, speculation makes sense now. That is a direct uh, translation to speculation is extremely social. And it's, uh, for me, it's a... Uh, it's a social movement. It should be a social movement and understanding that speculation is not only a mean to win a, a competition, which I love the way that you picture it. It's, a, it's an end itself. I mean, when, when we understand a speculation as that, then all of a sudden fiction uh, can become a reality tool. Uh, you know, uh, fiction can become something that we should live with. Uh, and not something that is beyond the limits of reality, but it's actually a part of our way of thinking itself. So, um, yeah, I wanted to to jump into that because uh, for me it was uh, it took some time to understand the power of speculation, uh, especially because we we come from a heritage of star architects, and uh, and we also come from a heritage of really material architecture. Luckily, uh, we are dealing with terms like interior ecologies nowadays, uh, uh, that's all of a sudden are breaking away um, from these topics. We just had uh, Meteora, Studio Meteora, also bringing a really, really sexy approach to new ways of architecture uh, that don't want to be good, that want to be, you know, are really critical. Um, so when, when listening and when, you know, diving into your into your project, your storytelling, um, Planet City. Um, it's really interesting how you mix speculation with data, with facts. Uh, there's a, and I think there's a really, well, there's a really responsible approach on how you offer and you, uh, you work with speculation because there's really impactful data, really impactful, uh, you know, numbers real numbers that all of a sudden make the speculate your speculation process your speculation uh, projects um you know like they just put it down on earth and i don't know it, some some people could actually say well it's not a speculation no more um any insights on on that relation yeah i mean i, I think there's an important difference to make between speculation and fantasy um like star wars is a work of fantasy right? Uh, Game of Thrones is the work of fantasy. Um, and, you know, these things have a role in our world, like on a Friday night when the weight of the world has crushed your spirit. Sometimes it's nice to watch a dragon set someone on fire or to see a, you know, a laser sword battle, right? But um, we're talking about something very different, right? And I, I, I see Planet City as a work of speculative fiction. Um, speculation, I think the difference is that you know, our methodology is one of exaggeration, extrapolation. Really, Planet City as a science fiction city doesn't include any imaginary technology that doesn't already exist. Um, it, it's just turning up the volume or removing the roadblocks on things like uh, solar power or wind energy or pumped hydro power storage or vertical farming technologies. Um, these are systems that already exist um, for the most part have existed maybe for 10 or 15 years, but through various political narratives or lack of cultural investment, we haven't rolled them out at scales that would be meaningful in the context of, um, you know, planetary scale climate collapse. And that's what Planet City does. It's just imagine what would a city look like built entirely through these systems where the regulatory bodies, uh, the lobby groups that keep them down vanish. Um, so, you know, really we're extending, uh, you know, a practice of science and technology. And for the most part, I'm a, I'm a science illustrator in many ways. Um, my most recent project that I also included in the presentation yesterday uh, called The Great Endeavour is just that. It's, it's really taking a bunch of scientific papers on 
um, carbon removal, you know, large scale carbon capture and carbon storage and visualizing what that would look like at a planetary scale, what would become the largest construction project in our human history, what I described yesterday as our generation's moon landing is really a visualization of the work of an amazing international group of scientists and technologists that have been pushing these technologies. Um, and I think the visualization, the speculation of, of, of what these papers mean is important um, because you know, in, in that case, this is a this is an infrastructure we just don't talk about. Um, yet without a carbon infrastructure equivalent in scale to the current fossil fuel industry, literally we go extinct. Um, mm -hmm. We don't talk about it because the visions of our future don't look like massive walls of fans and, you know, um, pumping liquid carbon into, into the rock beneath the ocean or, or, or the mountains of um, the Middle East. It, 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 it looks like community gardens in Brooklyn and trees on rooftops and rolling green hills with people, you know, herding cattle and sheep returning to the local. Um, and it's important to use speculation and fiction in this moment in time to introduce new images of our future that are scalable and viable, um, mm. given the, the mode of crisis we're now in. And those visions of the future that, you know, when we Google utopia those images are based in the failed ideals of 60s and 70s environmentalism they're images that are ingrained in us through the mediums of popular culture and fiction um and if you know you know if, if we need to rally around images of what our, what our future should be those images should be um real and meaningful um they should be based in science and technology not based in some fiction of what nature used to be um uh so that's why i think you know uh, fiction is this extraordinary project of our generation really if if climate change is no longer a technological problem if the solutions that we have are already the solutions that we need are actually already here then climate change is now a cultural and political problem what that means is you need to make work that resonates in a cultural and political space um we're not sitting around for some tech billionaire to figure it out for us uh, we need to have a conversation, uh, a debate um, on what it means to um, to continue to have the prospect of a future because at the moment the systems required to do that are systems that are quite controversial and provocative. Maybe uh, Liam? Hi, hello, nice to meet you. Hi. Um, uh, thanks a lot for your participation in the symposium. We were very much uh, impressed by the film uh, yesterday and we have been discussing about it today. Um, in the in the previous discussion with Beatriz uh, Colomina, we were also talking about technologies of vision, and obviously your work is very, very well known for uh, the capacity of kind of the vision devices to take a role in 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 in, in the film itself as kind of not only kind of witnesses but also kind of uh, prompts and actors of the narration and of the storytelling. And uh, over the last you know over the last twenty years, to be simple, we have seen a. a radical multiplication of the of the amount and quantity and uh, diversity of uh, vision machines and devices uh, and it seems that we are going twofold no it seems that we are putting on the sky uh, more and more drones and kind of uh, machines that have the capacity to to scan uh, and to uh, kind of convey images of the world uh, from many uh, kind of distant uh, geographies and location and at the same time it seems that also like vision devices such as the mobile phone are getting getting closer to us getting closer to the to the human body uh and now we we see that it might happen that intelligent lenses and glasses might really uh, start to happen on a kind of mainstream level so we have recently seen how, that meta is uh, developing the technology very thoroughly so it might happen that the next step from the desktop computer to the mobile phone might be like really the smart uh, glasses on a, on a massive scale so I, I i'm curious to to learn from your perspective how you think that this plethora and diversity of vision machines that are getting far and far away from the human body and closer and closer to the human body uh, could transform uh, the human cognition and our way of fabricating visions of the world and uh, speculative design. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think the, the interesting, most interesting shift that's happening is that 
for a long time visioning machines as you describe them were attempting to mimic the way that we see right um like a, a camera was striving for some kind of authentic image that would mimic the image mm. that the photographer sees with their own eyes mm. um uh but with the rise of machine vision and non-human actors these modes of seeing are now becoming very very different and now the patterns of human occupation, the patterns of human sight, and no longer the vision systems are actually defining experiences anymore. Um, where we're sharing our lives with things like drones or autonomous vehicles, um, other forms of sensing networks that you know see in infrared or that that see mm. through lidar scanning, which is you know some of the vision systems that I was talking about um, yesterday, or or a processing either laser point clouds or um, 2D image systems with uh, image recognition algorithms or other kinds of you know, body recognition algorithms. I was talking about gate detection algorithms in, in my um, film yesterday. Um, these forms of you know, image processing, you know, this is the big shift that's happening. Um, and when to a large extent, we're beginning to redesign our cities based on these modes of seeing, not based on our own human patterns. Um, you know, that signifies a radical shift in power relations. Um, you know, we haven't yet rolled out autonomous vehicles at the scale that the auto industry would have hoped by now, but that's coming, you know, in five, uh, maximum 10 years. Um, what that means is that all of the sensibilities and senses around which we have been previously designing our streetscapes shift. Um, and they now start to resonate in the infrared spectrum, or they now start to be responsive to um, the laser light of a LIDAR, LIDAR scanner, because you know these are the things that we're now sharing our streets with. Um, you know, the, the curves of a Zaha building on a street um, are less responsive to a LIDAR scanner than a boxy modernist building. Um, the surface detail of, you know, an ornate tiled surface um, is better for image recognition than some smooth curvilinear nondescript surface. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we used to define those aesthetic movements in architecture based on you know, cultural sensibilities or the way that the human eye reads a surface um, or reads light falling across it. And now it's going to be about LIDAR scanning because you don't want a car to like smash through a Zaha building because it can't recognize where its edge is. So um, we're very quickly, if not already, going to be remaking architecture based on an entirely new um, uh, set of requirements. Um, you know, the Neufert's Guide, the, the metric handbook um, for autonomous vehicles is going to shape our streetscapes much more than um, new urbanism and, and the sensibilities of Jane Jacob and, you know, sitting mm -hmm. in a cafe sipping coffee under a tree. So um, that's uh, something that we're going to have to come to terms with. You know, we might define a window and the surface of that window, not because of, how light penetrates it and how we like to sit by a window having breakfast in the morning sun, but instead based on laser penetration or, you know, transmissibility of Wi-Fi signals or other kinds of, um, uh, you know, uh, technical modes. So I think that's um, something that, that we need to come to terms with that that the machine inhabitants that are defined are now defining our cities much more so than we are. <laughs> Fascinating. And yes. when it comes to the when it comes to the uh, for example, just very briefly to elaborate on the question on the autonomous vehicle that you have pointed a few times in the reply, we know that the technology has been ready uh, for for years, and that actually one of the things that was kind of uh, stopping the technology from being implemented was were legal reasons actually uh, who is liable when an accident happens and so on and so forth. And obviously, I think that when it comes to the question of powers and asymmetries of powers and who is taking the decision of what and so on and so forth and how the machine is reacting to uh, uh, an informing uh, contemporaneity, 
uh, then the law and the legal regulations are critical at this discussion. No? Uh, so do you think that uh, all these um, capacity of contemporary technology to substitute the human eye by the fabrication of new images is going to progressively, and this is also the thesis in the thesis of many philosophers and scholars, but you think that the, the state, the nation state, as we have known it kind of historically with a capacity to have sovereignty over certain territories is progressively being uh, not only put in crisis, but literally uh, questioned and uh, obliterated uh, because of uh, these new technologies. Yeah, yes. I mean, it has to really. Um, uh, I don't think it's necessarily just because of these new technologies. Like I think, you know, at the most recent COP summit, we see that the, the and the whole history of responses to climate change is, um, uh, you know, exposing the 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 total um, ineffectual nature of the model of nation states to do anything mm -hmm. um, meaningful in the context of a planetary scale crisis like climate change, like the vested interests of national entities fighting for their own um, uh, prosperity is exactly what's been killing the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the, that, that model is clearly... Um, insufficient to mm -hmm. to 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 do what's what needs to be done um and yeah we you know we're also seeing um you know uh, stacks of of technology companies that have more power more gdp than than most nation states emerge um displacing the the power of a sovereign state um uh but at the same time you know, I don't think we should be mourning that loss. I don't think we should be trying to figure out how to reclaim um, that power for the nation state. Instead, I think, you know, a project like Planet City is trying to speculate on alternative models um, of organization mm -hmm. um, and alternative forms of citizenry that that, that don't just exist um, around, you know, the, the this this fiction of national borders that mm -hmm. randomly at various points in time were drawn on a map, but instead, what does it mean to to be responsible to, um, you know, a large entity like like the Earth? Like, what does it mean to be a citizen of the planet, not a citizen of the United States? What are our responsibilities in those terms, and how does that shape what it is that we do, and how does that shape um, regulatory models? You know, we mm -hmm. saw most recently. Um, you know, we are able to act in some form where we started to put regulation around protecting um, areas of the sea that fell outside of national borders. Um, up until very recently, just 1% um, of that territory was protected. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now we've put in place new regulations that, that start to define that. But things like atmospheres, you know, that, that are constantly shifting and moving that we now need to take responsibility for and you know, carbon parts per million, like they all suggest, again, new regulatory systems that are required, um, new systems of governance that, that aren't about just protecting the lines on the map vertically. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I quite welcome the revision of the nation state uh, because, yeah, uh, all we see is its failure at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, when, uh, now that you just mentioned how, um, you know, the ocean was unprotected in that, I mean, that the line uh, beyond the nation state and the, the national protection of the ocean left the, the ocean untreated. Um, there's this uh, interesting fun fact of the um, Yellowstone National Park and how protection actually rendered visible a line to which we could uh, um, we could limit the violence we then uh, apply to to the environment. Um, before the the first national park was uh, was um, you know drawn, and it was actually a really a red square line over a map. Um, that first line that was uh, you know drawing the limit of what was to be protected was also having a secondary effect, which is everything outside of that line is unprotected. And it's really interesting how, uh, you know, well, uh, we really need to revision how national states or how humans, we try to protect 
because when doing so, we have been living unprotected many other areas. So rethinking and reclaiming a way of, of uh, you know, uh, of understanding what is protection, I think it's it's crucial. And in in the the world or in the concept that you said we belong to, or we inhabit the world, we don't inhabit the USA. There's a lot of parts of that protection and protection uh, to be everything, right? I don't know. There's a there's a, a parallelism that I think it's beautiful. That if we all of a sudden erase the border of the USA or the border of, of Spain, then we all have a um, small uh, take into the the whole um, you know the whole Gaia, which is uh, which could be definitely a, a position and a, an objective in uh, towards a planetary solution. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, for one of our unknown fields expeditions that I that that I ran with Kate, um, we we were in Madagascar, and we visited uh, the, a piece of rainforest that was protected by Air France, essentially carbon offsets. Like when you when you carbon offset your flight on Air France, they would you know. Uh, put that money into protecting a little bit of rainforest in the Madagascar in in, in Madagascar Island, um, uh, and we went to that fence. Um, uh, and on one side of the fence is is pristine rainforest, and the other side of the fence is an indigenous community um, uh, living in the mud um, that were displaced from the rainforest where they'd lived for generations and generations. So that um, people in the West could feel better about themselves flying all over the world. Um, so yeah, there's always this strange politics around protection um, that also sometimes somehow goes hand in hand with politics of exclusion um, and displacement. So yeah, what do, what do new models look like? And we're seeing that happen, you know, for better or worse in, in really strange ways, you know, where um, the previous Brazilian president, you know, started burning down the Amazon and in response to the outcry of, of Western nations said, okay, well, give us a lot of money and they'll stop doing it. You know what I mean? Like, like pay to protect this forest that you think is so special um, uh, and we'll stop, stop burning it down. So you start to see like, you know what are the what are new models that might emerge where um you know an alliance of planetary organizations come together nation states or otherwise to start to protect resources that are valuable at planetary scales um uh is that a viable solution like we start to think about the carbon economy in the same in the same way um there are no lines drawn in in the atmosphere um, what does it mean to start to maintain a parts per million register um, in the same way that we maintain a national park? Who's responsible for that? Um, who's responsible for the waste that that so many um, quote unquote first world nations have been putting into the air for generations? Um, you know, if we see carbon as a waste product, just like nuclear waste uh, or rubbish. Um, who cleans it up? Where do we stick it? Um, uh, who's responsible for that? Who's going to pay for it? Um, like these are all like desperately urgent questions. Um, and again, the, the, the existing models just don't have answers for that. Um, what we're seeing is that unless someone can make money out of it, it's not going to happen. So like, what does it mean to introduce a viable carbon economy? Um, uh, how will how will that work? Will carbon be understood as a waste product, as I was describing, or is it a new kind of resource? Um, again, big questions that we haven't defined the answer for. But you know, these are the questions that define our generation. I think. Um, uh, and to go back to one of your very first questions, like if we aren't dealing with these questions in design or architecture schools, then what the hell are we doing? Um, the great tragedy of our discipline is that most of the institutions are being run um, by and, and are maintaining some idea of the profession that, that no longer exists. Um, you ask any recent graduate, you know, what it means to go out into the world with a PDF portfolio, submitting it to architecture offices, like that model where you used to like apply to the most famous office you could, you know, start out 
building models and then drafting crap and then moving up, becoming a project architect and, um, you know, going out and running your own firm. Like these models just no longer viable, you know, like what we used to think of as being on the margins of the profession, the stuff that we would might do like speculation, making films, um, writing, um, any other kind of side hustle, uh, is now firmly in the middle of the discipline. The people on the margins are those still maintaining a practice by making buildings on, alone. Um, yet the majority of architecture schools still teach that model um, as if the last 20 years never happened. Uh, so what does it mean to create um, someone who leaves school with the capacity to think at planetary scales? You know, like you take just a... A simple document like the site plan that for the most part is uncontested in in modern architecture schools. The site plan is the root is the root of so many problems, right? Like it defines the scope of an architectural project. The site plan is generally the largest scale drawing that you would ever draw in the, when, when making a project. Um, anything that falls off the site plan isn't the subject of your work. Um get, you know, what's a site plan scale, one to 5,000 maybe at the most. Um, uh, what does it mean to to engage with the planet as a site? Um, what type of drawings are sufficient to deal with the, the system of flows and networks that, you know, even the simplest simplest of buildings um, participates in and, and redefines? Um, you know, what does it mean to draw a site plan that, that includes the, the mining landscape where the material to produce your building comes from it exists? You know, like, um, you know, even in the context of interiors, you know, simple things like specifying the glue on a wall or the paint on a surface, that paint comes from um, a, an ore that's mined from Australia or from the sands of Madagascar. Titanium white, um, you know, is is mined from an extraordinary constellation of landscapes. You know, the interior ecology is a planetary one. Um, we used to define disciplines through scale. You know, an interior architect worked at the scale of interiors, an architect worked at the scale of buildings, an urbanist worked at the scale of cities. You know, when we start to talk about, you know, these planetary scale crises, those scales differentiations are, are, are uh, really problematic um, because an interior designer should understand the complex web in which the choices they're making um, resonate. So, um, yeah, you know, the traditional discipline uh, and the traditional institutions that 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 construct those disciplines uh, are no longer fit for purpose. Um, uh, so we need a total paradigm shift in in the context of what schools are and and also what the profession is. I think this is a this is a formidable uh, reflection on how to uh, kind of deconstruct like the traditional pedagogy of architecture schools, which is uh, I totally agree is very problematic in its perpetuation of systems that are no longer valid uh, when it comes to contemporary challenges such as the climate crisis, but also the refugee crisis, but also like the, the contemporary questions of gender theories, et cetera, like that. Like all the system that has been institutionalized in architectural pedagogy over the last, I don't know, two centuries from the polytechnic school to the centrality of drawing as opposed to other mediums, uh, centrality of the scale uh, to narrative thinking when it comes to do a project, like we start from a certain narrative and set of decisions that finally get to the construction detail and then you progressively obliterate kind of uh, things that are around like this kind of uh, uh, the context of the of the building and the political implications of design i think that this starts right uh, at the beginning of architectural education and i could not agree uh, more on this uh, reflection on the importance of of, of that actually mm -hmm. um pablo how do you want to go about the about the call phone uh you want <laughs> you... yes uh um well yeah we have this idea liam uh actually since you are here uh, we have this idea actually i'll let me check to you too um we don't have that many i mean viewers are are i mean taking it easy today so we have this idea of making a really big colophon on on opening our cameras to see what the interior ecologies of the people connected to this conference look like um 
actually i'm just going to go ahead and just send the link if someone wants to join i would love to to do so um actually um i guess before finishing with liam the um there's uh there's something i wanted to point out that it's been uh you know you know bouncing in my head all the time which first go about aesthetics and then about the scale of the of the of your of your video which quickly jump from a i mean as even the the name says planet city they go from a really big scale images of these huge buildings which really get you beyond the the city scale but then there's really intimate on really small scale images of of people dressed with really particular and really well chosen or well really chosen and really designed aesthetics that make me think of future cultures that are not so situated but are linearly or like planetary so i wanted to point out that how i really i'm beginning to understand your vision on the importance of planetary thinking when thinking about a city when thinking about an individual when thinking about an interior ecology I don't know if you want to um, elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it relates to exactly what I was just talking about in that, like, it's impossible to understand something like a T-shirt without understanding the the water that is drawn, that goes mm -hmm. into it, um, without understanding the cotton fields in India and all the politics around cotton farmers and the suicides that, that previously happened. Um, uh, so, you know, the... The citizens of Planet City wear garments um, that are made from felts that have been processed by, um, you know, basically pulping up um, old clothes, um, uh, you know, new fabrics that aren't produced from virgin ground, um, but are rather recycled um, from existing systems. Uh, the idea with the city itself is that no new resources have been consumed to, to make the city, both at, at all scales, the scale of the building um, uh, to the scale of the, the garment or the mask or the costume. Um, because again, th those, those scale differences are irrelevant, right? Like um, a fashion designer is operating on a planetary scale through the choices they make. Um, so it's important that at all scales, you could see the the manifesto and the narrative of the mm. city. Um, uh, and that also, you know, happens at a cultural scale, right? Like the, 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 the characters in the city are performing certain mm. rituals and practices and dances that are based on um, the new narratives, the new mythologies, the, the new stories of the city, right? Um, you saw glimpses of the drone shepherds, um, who, you know, in the festival that the, that the film is, is documenting, um, are enacting the, the beasts of burden that used to work the land um, uh, back in the past um, because it's important to remember how we used to treat other species. Um, mm. uh, they're now working um, through um, uh, drones and technological systems that are managing the, the productive fields and landscapes of this fictional planet city. Um, but they dance and enact the spirits of of the animals that have come before them. Um, you see the algae farmers um, dancing by the algae canals. Um, uh, those algae canals are a key energy source and, and food source in the city. Algae is the most productive and efficient way to turn sunlight into calories. Um, uh, but those same lakes also uh, store the potential energy of, of, of the city. Um, solar and wind um, essentially powers turbines that, that pump water to, to high altitude lakes, uh, storing that energy as potential energy. Um, so when the sun isn't shining, when the wind isn't blowing, you know, you turn the tap on and essentially power starts to flow from those, from those gravity fed lakes. So, um, you know, at all scales, um, the city is trying to operate in a planetary sense. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's just one little prototype, a little thought experiment that, that starts to explore what cities might become. But at the same time, you know, the the work that I do at SIARC with my uh, master's program in, in, uh, in fiction entertainment, you know, my own practice are also attempts to prototype what it might mean to be a different type of architect. 
um, that mm. that you know creates new models of work uh, that aren't just like hobbies or things one does in between um, doing real buildings, but instead um, is sustainable models of practice that are about imagining um, new ways the discipline can operate in a time of planetary collapse. I have I have maybe uh, elaborated very rapidly, uh, probably because we were about to open the discussion to to the to the interior ecologies behind us. But uh, 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 just uh, coming back to you just mentioned like the sun, and uh, I have a question uh, related to the imagery and the aesthetics of the of the film itself as a piece of cinema, uh, because there seems to be a how to say a certain kind of preference in the aesthetics of this film for. Um, this um, Blade Runner like kind of aesthetics mm. in which it's, mm. uh, it's quite often night. Uh, there's this kind of Hong Kong or Asian like mm. aesthetics with a lot of super slender skyscrapers and a certain mm. sense of verticality mm. where there is not a lot of sunlight. And actually, I was kind of wondering when it comes to the new politics of the nature and the carbon, uh, the, the carbon footprint uh, economy, and the question. Actually, night and the intensification of uh, human life at night uh, has been massively polluting, and as of today, it's also quite polluting. So that's one of the the disruption of the circadian rhythm in human life. Actually, is very problematic in its carbon footprint. So I would like to 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 understand how, for example, this universe of light that in other uh, historic pieces of cinema have been regarded as dystopian, such as Blade Runner, actually it's, mm. it's kind of trying to be inverted here in your in your proposal. And would you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, great question. The It, it really comes down to this idea that, uh, as I mentioned before, that that our images of the future, um, you know, the, our images of an aspirational future um, are based in outmoded environmental ideals, right? Um, mm uh you know where the sky is blue and roofs are green um and then like you said like anything that that doesn't fit into that model that isn't green is a dystopia mm -hmm. um uh but the reality is that you know farming has now become like massive industrialized production you know the idea of you know someone growing local produce and that feeding anything other than boutique restaurants has long since gone. Um, mm. The most organic strawberry on earth is grown in a warehouse in New Jersey, right? Um, it's grown with very little water resources. It's grown with no pesticides because it's grown in a sealed environment, essentially like a clean room. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, these are the systems that that are viable at the scale of 10 billion people, which is where we're headed in 2050. Um Uh, they're grown under purple LED light because blue and red light is the spectrum that's most efficient for plant growth. Mm -hmm. um, so the light that you see in Planet City is is this purple glow is to try and um, get us into the idea that our future isn't going to be green and blue, but in many ways it's going to be various shades of purple um, mm. because this is the forms of light we need for intense growth um to support you know a growing population and to not decimate the planet with industrialized um uh, open air agriculture so it's a provocative image and and mm -hmm. a lot of people you know equate it with something like blade runner a lot of people think it and feel that it's a dystopian project purely because it doesn't fit in with their idea about what a productive and aspirational future should be mm -hmm. But when that vision is entirely outmoded and, um, you know, what it means is we need to update our ideas of what the utopian or the dystopian might be, mm -hmm. might look like. Um, so it's a provocation to say like, yeah, like this, this is an aspirational future. It doesn't look like the ones that you know, culturally you're, you're conditioned to, but that's exactly the point. Um, Uh, similarly with the great endeavor, like the reason we don't talk about planetary scale carbon capture because our visions of the future don't include, like I said, these massive pieces of infrastructure. But if they don't, there is no future. Um, so we desperately need to update our cultural imaginings um, of what of what's to come. Uh, and yeah, our attitude to light. Um, and, you know, that's just a symptom of our attitude to nature. 
um, all that needs to shift. And the dominant models that we might talk about at an you know ecology conference typically, uh, you know, are about you know reinforcing the mythology of the local. Right? Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as a local iPad. What what could that even be? Um, the genie is out of the bottle. You know, we're not going to return to log cabins in the hills to you know raise our own chickens and grow tomatoes in the backyard. Um, what does a complex planetary scale sustainable future look like? And it's not, um, you know, farms on vacant blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know, hundred story vertical farms um, growing produce in under purple LEDs. Um, or we stop having children and reduce the population to about 3 billion, then we can have our chickens back, you know, um, uh, then we can, you know, have a backyard again. Um, so, you know, our generation is faced with pretty simple choices. Um, uh, at the moment, which is head in the sand, we're not making those choices, but Mm -hmm. work like, like the ones that we're producing, which I'm defining as kind of new planetary imaginaries, uh, the beginnings of, of trying to have that conversation. You know, we either start to consolidate and densify um, in forms like Planet City uh, or we um, deal with radical scale population control, mm-hmm. which is a more preferable future. Um, you know, and, and I'd, I'm not trying to present or overlay my version of, of what that future should be. I'm just, I'm just, talking about the options um, hmm. and then collectively we had to have we have to have that conversation fascinating Thank you. yeah i i really like i love how you said we i mean it's a simple i mean there are simple options we hmm. just, we need to see the real i mean we need to see them re- like in real how they are yet which is maybe why uh well, we still stick to a romanticized view of nature. We still stick to a really romanticized view of our relation to the context. And okay. with that uh, heritage, with that weight, well, we still imagine a really green future as the only option. So, um, well, um, Liam, it's been an incredible conversation. Thank you so much. I think it's been really inspiring. I get interior ecologies are planetary as some major, like a really strong uh, statement that is going to like accompany me from now on. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We really enjoyed your movie yesterday. We really enjoyed your conversation today. We have actually had, since we have no limit, uh, we got into a long conversation, which is uh, what I love the most out of these uh, conferences. So thank you for this time that you have given us. Um, Javier, I don't know if you want to uh, say. No, like likewise, Liam. It's been a, a real pleasure. Uh, I think that most of the topics we have been discussing uh, with you are ongoing discussion uh, at the Department of Interior Architecture at Geneva now. So, the the goal of organizing this kind of uh, discussions uh, with guests, but also with the Institute of Postnatural Studies, is really to reflect together upon uh, these challenges that are urgent and that uh, should uh, imply the redefinition of what we understand of our, about architecture as of today. You know, so it's also an invitation to reflect together and to uh, see whether we should be uh, in a kind of uh, romanticized position or whether we should be techno optimistic or whether a school should be a place of reflection where students can critically reflect uh, upon these uh, um, questions, but with a uh, political, critical, speculative, and scientific understanding of the implications of the choices that, that we make uh, as of today. And I think that for that, your work uh, kind of uh, over the last uh, 15 years has been extremely relevant in the architectural discussions. And um, I think that we we get, as Paulo said, a few a few quotes from your replies directly that will apply uh, to the program. And uh, I'm very happy that we could have like this final uh, discussion as a colophon of the of the event and of the of the conference uh, together with you. You are mute. Oh, so it's, it's a great thanks. It sounds like a great event. Um, um, uh, yeah, it's all to be part of it. Thanks for including me. Um, hopefully, it was all uh, interesting, interesting conversations. I look forward to continuing them uh, at some point in the future, if we have one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Great. All right. Thanks, folks. Bye, everyone.
Okay, bye. thank you, Liam. Bye, bye. bye Liam. And uh, um, if if you want, we can wrap it up here. No, we can. Uh, just... um, actually, there's something I would like to uh, just to do with you, which is uh, even if it's uh, a few, like uh, only a few minutes between you and I. Um, it's like out of like through all this conference. Uh, I think we have been running to uh, a, a myriad of of definitions of interior ecologies, and I wanted to point out just some of the quotes that we have been running, uh, listening to. Um, starting, I'm actually going to start backward from uh, Liam's uh, contribution to the very first one, but it's uh, I mean I get sentences or concepts as interior ecologies are planetary, which is beautiful. Um, when talking to Beatriz, we we were also pointing out to the technologies of vision and how uh, these technologies are reshaping and are going to reshape interior ecologies. Um, talking to Meteora uh, and the relation to uh, to technology, um, we need to make sure that interior ecologies are biased, are absolutely biased by our ethics, not about the morals, but our but by our ethics and this is a um, concept that we need to keep in mind when dealing with uh, these, intel these intelligences and these technologies that are going to be living with us. Um, interior ecologies are also collective experiences as Samanemo Afi uh, you know saw us and how um, you know the interior of a, of a building, the interior of a house which seems apparently objective, it's full of really sub a lot of subjectivities and how objects are filled with meaning, and these objects create a really political context. Um, interior ecologies are relational ecologies also, because uh, at the end, and this is based on, on the human as part of this interior ecology, um, we rely on relations, and therefore we make our context a relational context. Um, we also find out and I really like this term of uh, the post-performative interior or the post-performative, um, you know, scene uh, as if each of us are always performing. And this this is uh, coming from gender studies and coming from uh, Judith Butler's uh, subjectivity theory. We are always performing. So again, our interior ecologies, our interiors are post-performative. They are always the post of what we've been doing. And it's uh, really, really beautiful. And um, I think as uh, coming, of course, from my background, um, interior ecologies are um, about coexistence, are about a multi-species and um, interior ecologies for who? Right? Uh, not only one individual, but many individuals, not only human, but more than human, and hopefully this more than human will also uh, englobe uh, non-living entities, uh, either from technologies or non-technologies. Uh, from, you know, uh, I don't know, it's just a, a recollection of thoughts uh, that I think uh, is a, a nice, a beautiful recap of all the, all the lectures, all the concepts, all the discourses that we listen to. I don't know if you, if you want to say something back. I think that it's a, it's a very beautiful uh, call of for the for the conference. I mean, it could even be like a list of quotes as if it was like uh, ecological poetry, you know, as a format of, of literature, so to say. But I think that I couldn't agree more. And I think that uh, for us at the department, it's very valuable uh, information and insights to keep on uh, developing the, the topic together with the students. Um, uh, which is actually the main goal of this this event. But I would also like to to thank you, uh, Pablo, and the Institute for Post Natural yeah. Studies for the uh, collaboration, for how you can nourish the program, uh, for how you are reacting to contemporary and urgent challenges on on interior design, architecture, and, and ecology. Um, and also, like uh, I think I don't know if the students are still there, but. Is to say that the fact that the students can actively engage in these discussions and shape what a contemporary conference on interior ecologies is about and to reflect together on the hypothesis and on terminology on the glossary of the um, semiological implications of these terms to address uh, current issues is very valuable for for us so i see that sophia is back but she might be she might be surrounded by or accompanied by by other students because we know that we have this kind of digital background so there are ghostly presences there <laughs> And so maybe maybe 
uh, as we were thinking before, maybe we can turn off uh, our digital backgrounds and show where we uh, where we are. Uh, this is like the collection <laughs> of this collection of interiors. So this is my this is the interior uh, which I've been uh, talking to. Uh, yours is quite similar, I have to say. I think. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, because we are, in, we are next. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah. We are in adjacent rooms uh, at Geneva, so you uh, we are mirroring. Uh, I see that uh, kind of the computer is being lifted on the other room, so uh, and everything looks quite similar. But yeah. uh, that's a beautiful place, by the way, Pablo. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, well, I cannot do it from my office. We had some uh, well um, contingencies contingencies in our office, so I had to move to. This uh, well to my house. This is my my house, which is a warehouse, which is transformed. So yeah, there's a, a whole topic there about unfinished uh, interiors and how they can adapt to contemporary ways of of living. So this is why the house, even though like it's all the materials are unfinished, everything. So it's easily it's easier to readapt. Uh, just you know, a funny story about the place <laughs> where I am. It's a very beautiful house, uh, Pablo, actually, uh, and I really like the concept. Uh, I had seen some some photos uh, during construction site that you had posted on online, but uh, that looks very interesting as a concept and as a result, actually. Looking forward to learning more about your upcoming projects. Yes. And maybe we, we pass it to the students also, like to, even though uh, I only see uh, uh, Sofia, Emma, and Roberto, who is obviously not a student, but also like a teacher. Uh, in the department and scientific advisors of the conference, but maybe we we give the floor to you and you can you can wrap it up and do the final uh, sentence of the of the of the conference. Mm. Yeah, I think just uh, to thank again Pablo and the institute, and I mean everyone that participated, all the speakers, contributors, uh, audience, because I mean without them and their work and sharing their knowledge, we wouldn't have had a conference in the first place. So. Um, yeah, just to thank everyone involved, and we hope that it provided a place for discussion and new thoughts to be formulated and for the conversation to continue. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, it's my time to say thank you, Hev. Thank you to all the Maya students for the work, uh, because you have been running this conference uh, in the crucial days. So. I have to thank you for that, and especially to all contributors, to all the contributors that um, share their content with us, especially on the digital archive, that couldn't be, that couldn't be here presenting themselves, but still trusted us and shared their work with us. So thank you. Thank you to all of you, and hope to see you soon. Yeah, hope to see you soon. Stay tuned and uh, enjoy the break, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you. Merry <laughs> Christmas. And bravo, Pablo. Bye. Bye. Great, great job. Thank you. Congratulations. Bye-bye. <laughs>